and welcome to Varm Blog. And uh, I'm here with Joe Payne of Political Pain. Um, one of my earliest guests on this channel about three years ago. Uh, lots changed since then. Um, hey, Brian. Hey. And uh, uh, two years ago, just to remind people, or three years ago, um, <laughs> been doing this for a while. Uh, just to remind people, you came on the show to talk about the development of journalism and its abandonment of any lower working class base. So, you know, mm. uh, the on the decimation of the industry, uh, by the tech Lords and all of that jazz. For yeah. Sure. I mean, it, it's related because what, it, what that does is it makes, uh, journalism an influence slash um altruistic enterprise and who can afford to do that but the children of the wealthy and that also means that credentialization starts being weirdly a priority even though it's a priority that doesn't lead to anything much about the job i mean there's no reason why a journalist needs more than I would say an associate's degree training today. And uh, if we were still dealing with writing training from 20 years ago, maybe even just a high school degree, but that's, that's my uh, uh, abject uh, and opinion as a person who dropped out of journalism and, and in, in the year 2000, fearing what was going to happen uh, with the internet and being, both right and also under ambitious about how bad it was going to go. Um, <laughs> yeah. Uh, so, <laughs> yeah, well, I mean, I, I started out as a, um, as a writer at a weekly, uh, uh, a community alt weekly newspaper and like as an intern in high school and then getting a part-time job and then, you know, working my way up over the years. Um, but it's definitely one of those things where having a newspaper in your community, having multiple newspapers in your community uh, that, I mean, the, the people who report usually at these papers are a part of your community as well. You know, they go to your local government meetings. Like it, it's an important hub in the spoke of our, you know, severely flawed system. Um, and it's just been deteriorated and um, atrophied. And so journalism, I mean, I... I I waited to go get my, um, this could kind of dovetail into what we're here to talk about, but I waited to get my, um, you know, my bachelor's degree and, um, I'm now continuing on to get a master's. Um, you know, I didn't do it right out of high school and I didn't want to study journalism because I was working in journalism and I kind of realized I'd be stupid <laughs> to go pay to get a degree in that. If I was gaining all the experience I needed uh, to write, which it was, you know, a weekly paper every week, you have to write something. So that's a good way to, to start writing is have a system set up where you have to write, um, you know, and so uh, I'm glad I waited to transfer and go study um, history now because it's just taking this kind of writing base that uh, I developed and expanding on it and challenging myself in that respect. Um, and I actually kind of discovered what I'm, my focus is um, in my local journalism, you know, looking at local history and whatnot. Yeah. Um, I mean, that's going to get us to talk about the Chumash War, but uh, I think one of the things that we have to deal with, and I say, I, I say this a lot as, as uh, reading a lot of international journalists, I, I think I came down <laughs> real hard on Vincent Bevins for being like, I saw uh, very good on contemporary issues, but having no historical context to understand that like their actual analysis was not as good as their reporting. Um, I, you know, I was very sympathetic to Bevan's complaining about, well, you know, we always reported this through English language, uh, uh, news reporting. I remember during the Arab spring watching democracy now and going, you're only talking to people who speak English, which means they're, and they speak English well, yeah, exactly. uh, which means they're either foreign educated and come back. Are there highly, highly educated elites? Um, Interesting. Which means you're getting a very particular perspective about what's going on. And Bevins calls this out in his book uh, on the subject, but then kind of also does it um, himself and like going through these people's critiques of the movement mm -hmm. as kind of self critiques of these like 
anarchist inspired fairly well educated elites as opposed to like i don't know talking to muslim brotherhood members and etc who may not be so well versed in that kind of theory and so you know i remember just thinking like a you need a historian to really clue you in because you believe a lot of myths about these prior movements um, Mm -hmm. more unified than they actually were um and and that's leading you to make some mistakes in analysis and to uh even though you see the problems with over relying on english speakers and people you can communicate with mm-hmm. you're still kind of doing it so mm-hmm. um i haven't read that bevan's book i read the jakarta method which i um enjoyed quite a bit um but i thought it was an interesting his um journalist's take um on history but yeah you have you do have to um look at it for the the weaknesses that are there i guess or or trying to you know i mean of course just talking i think it's important to talk to survivors of something like what happened in indonesia in the cold war i've um been attempting to reach out to ancestors of chumash who um, lived through the war um you know i think it's important to bring uh folks' voices in there but um you also gotta i mean it's part of why i've taken a bit of a hiatus from my channel while i'm in school is um and you know when you go to write something you know, just based on what I've read so far in my master's program, I go back and I read my um, senior project uh, that got published about this topic. And I go, oh, my gosh, there's so many other things like <laughs> I hadn't read yet that I could have tied into here um, or brought into it. But it's definitely one of those things where um, for me, studying history, I was very much inspired by uh, the late Michael Brooks to do so, um, because it is important to. Uh, like you said, have that necessary backstory. J- journalists so often, I mean, they, they, I, don't. I used to, they don't. I used to see it at, at my um, newspaper where they would want to hire um, young, fresh out of J school kids from, you know, uh, nowhere to come in and work for cheap. Uh, who are all, they're always, you know, 20 something uh, and willing to work for nothing. Um, and they would come into our community and then they don't know anything about our community. It's not like they don't know history. They don't know recent history. So you have that problem where um, just something like the most basic form, like reporting on your local city government or city budget, or, um, you know, that that's all just, it's, it's, it's all just kind of crumbled away and you're left with like Facebook groups and other kind of, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, the news newspapers are like aggregators of just like newswire services. You know, lo- local newspapers, and um, you know, it gets uh, gets depressing, honestly. But <laughs> well, I mean, there's a couple of things at issue here. One is like, for me, you have this breaking down of ungatekeep media, um, mm-hmm. but that does not necessarily lead you to more truth because. It's yeah. un- th- there's no one fact checking it. I mean, one of the things that I've been talking about is the real tragedy of the current moment is really good international reporters now participating in Twitter culture war shit because no one's funding them to go really do good international reporting except as commentary and punditry, not as actual reporting. Yeah. And um, this leads to a whole lot of like shoddy stuff going out there and people saying they know stuff that they actually do not know. Um, uh, that said, we also have to admit that the old system in some ways was worse or just as bad because the gatekeeping system really did narrow down acceptable opinion um, yeah. into like the two sides problem. And the two sides were, were, were fairly controlled on what they were. And now that that's broken up in a bit, that's led to a general distrust of the media because it was, frankly, um, uh, homogenizing things. And it's being partisanized has not really fixed that. It's only made it um, worse. Um, But, you know, for me and you, we're both leftists. I know that um, you and I have had quiet political differences, even though we're friends. Uh, uh, I wouldn't put you up against the wall, but you know, <laughs> well, uh, thank um, but um, I have the vindication of being pessimistic in regards to recent activism, and uh, mm-hmm. I just want to say that I actually think that's a weakness. It, it's a weakness that my pessimism is so often vindicated 
because it really shouldn't be like it. That's an easy position to take. Um, and um, I would love someone to push back on the quote black pill. Uh, okay. I'm not a black pillar though. And that's, that's what I, I think people misunderstand. I'm not here to like shoot down all your dreams just to shoot down all your dreams. I'm here to shoot down all the stupid parts of your dreams. So maybe some of the <laughs> smart parts can actually emerge. Um, mm -hmm. And when it comes to journalism, I think the left has, has actually not really looked at this uh, honestly, um, because one thing that I still have not seen addressed is the alternative quotation marks media. media. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Is just as much about, not having grounding in any particular place as anything else. So we have no incentive to actually work on local politics. And as I've told people who want to come on to my show to do that, like, I'm like, I'm not going to help you because my audience is, there's more audience. My audience in New York or in fucking Oslo or, or France or something. Yeah. Yeah. Or, yeah or, or, uh, for me, it's like Nordic countries, England, <laughs> Canada, and like the, the, the Northeast coast. Like some um, of the comedians I like. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, as opposed to even the West, you know, California, I think the only Western city that shows up high on my download rates is uh, Seattle and then Portland. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. I live in Salt Lake City. Like, mm -hmm. I, my own community doesn't really listen to me. Mm -hmm. um, and that means that as an answer to the problem of over nationalization and, and myopic media narratives, the alternative media actually doesn't answer the call because what it does is mainly just give an alternate voice on the same news that everyone else is spinning. So it's a different spin, uh, a bunch of different spins. It's not one spin, but it's not actually like no one's really building up like uh, like deep dive local labor reporting or um, uh, local political issues that lead you to understand the problems with national strategies because to really understand these problems, you actually do need to know local issues. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the ability to push out uh, to talk about labor unions where you're at as opposed to some abstract national average. Like there's, mm -hmm. there's a bunch of problems that the answer to the problem of, uh, you know, consensus main, mainstream, whatever that is, media still replicates many of the problems, okay? And I think when it comes to historical stuff like the Chumash War, this actually exacerbates uh, the situation. Um, well, there's a lot you could say there. Uh, I mean, I, I do see parallels, uh, um, you know, let me think let me think for a second because there was a lot there um you know you basically i mean i tried to do some of those things on my youtube channel um talk about local labor talk about local politics and there's very little like um audience for it um but you never know if you put together an okay video on some local uh, issue it might continue to get views as time goes on when people search your area i went on but of course you know it's like the algorithm is is funneling us all uh down reactionary rabbit holes all the time so like that my most watched video pertaining to local politics or anything local was when i went out and did one of my few uh protest live streams and like a trump supporter and a, a you know antifa guy started swinging at each other you know of course that's going to get a, get a lot of views so it, it's like you know you i mean th that same critique could exist for older forms of media i worked at an alternative newspaper um and even you know like in this uh very at the time conservative uh, agricultural valley it was it was understood that um you know we were considered the liberal paper you know but that was just because we would quote an an immigrants rights group um instead of whatever guy on the street saying we don't want him here <laughs> you know what i mean like we would actually call a nonprofit, and uh, unlike the um unlike the uh, daily news but even then like um the owner the publisher and and the people in charge were very like sensitive about upsetting the community and so it was only as um 
oppositional or as alternative as what that community would allow you, you know what i mean so so that um it's it's just like it's so weird because some things still exist a local fox affiliates television news still exists we have local uh conservative am radio subsidized by local business interests that still exists but the local newspapers have dwindled. There's less pages. There's less issues. There's, you know, come out. There's, um, you know, less news, less people working there, less positions. Um, and, you know, the, and the papers that still do exist, they've been consolidated corporate. And you're not going to, you just can't get local reporting after that. Uh, or you, you're not going to get the same kind of local reporting. Um, McClatchy near here had, a, had bought up a bunch of newspapers and one of them was near here. Um, in San Luis Obispo, and like they, they like all the editors or proofreaders went away. They're all state. They're all based in Sacramento now. So everybody in the state is sending all their stuff there. And like the first week, they committed this huge faux pas and like offended the community um, by trying to use some, you know, some story in their promotion, and it was in bad taste. And it was just because there was nobody there with a local connection to say, "Hey, guys, like, you know what I mean?" And and so there's all these issues. If we're gonna like broach into history. A parallel that I see, and it's um, pretty interesting, and, and we could talk about it, um, is just how, you know, when you go to study history academically, you're expected to, to choose a region, a time and a, and a place, and not look to, you know, far askance beyond that, um, or at least that's how it's it's been practiced. And um, it's really neat, you know, California mission history is technically Latin American history. It's like right at the end of uh, Spanish colonialism, uh, the Mexican Revolution, and, um, you know, the, the Mexican the Revolution for Independence. We got to be clear which revolution course, we're talking about. Thank right you very go. much. Yes, yes. Thank you very <laughs> the much. The independence, Please, yeah, not the other one. <laughs> Please correct me as many times. Uh, um, uh, yeah, uh, well, that, that's that, that's not for uh, that's not correcting you so much as it's making sure that my audience who doesn't know Mexican history keeps. Oh it yes, correct. yes, of course. Yeah, <laughs> and and um, you know, so I mean, out of Latin American history, we get the idea, or or we get world systems theory. Like that's you know, it com comes out of that, and just this idea of that, like you can't. Um, or comparative history. Um, some of these in the in the stack here are do comparative work. And uh, yeah, I was gonna say like uh, Latin American history is influenced by world systems theory, but uh, it's kind of French, like in an origin. Yeah, of course, it's Fr French Latin American studies. I can't remember. We were we were just. Um, I, I I was watching some of your videos about it, but uh, um, we were going uh, I, over it in Latin American history last uh, quarter. I was in. I can send you something about it. Uh, I guess this is also an advertisement to my audience that I have uh, um, a video that's patron only about an engagement I did with the Lefty Book Club explaining the weaknesses of the paradigm and the strengths of the paradigm. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of particularly weird overlapping history in and out of and in and out of Marxism. But like... I think you have to look at one thing that you have to think about when you deal with systems, right? Mm -hmm. um, there are innovative historians doing work on like the Mediterranean system or the transatlantic uh, trade network and transatlantic, you know, um, the development of, of the transatlantic uh, culture yeah. from from like west africa europe and uh, the settler mm -hmm. states in the americas triangle yeah yeah um you know so there there's not that there's no history that views the world that way but the dominant english paradigm i think because of fear of you know not just marxism but a lot of positivistic historical uh schools that tried to build systems in the 19th and early 20th century is to go running, screaming in the other direction, uh, eschewing anthropology, sociology, economics, etc., mm -hmm, mm -hmm. um, and doing micro history most of the mm -hmm. time as the dominant paradigm, um, which I find interesting yeah. even in itself. Like micro history as a field actually did not start off like hostile to systems. It was actually kind of emerging in Italy to like flesh out things that were being missed. Yeah. in this large systemic thing but it didn't see itself as opposed to that but in this like mm -hmm. i've heard people over and over and over again with historical training they're like we just don't do systems like that that's not what we do and i'm like 
I'm like, well, then how do you like justify your paradigms? And I get mm -hmm. something about research methodologies. And I'm like, yeah, that's not actually historiography, though. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like historiography actually does require you to have a theory and a set of norms to 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 figure this out. And it's not just methodological norms. It also unifies the vocabulary, et cetera. And like, for example, the many of the great historical debates right now is. X historiographic claim is not true. Like there is no dark ages or this, that, and the other. And <laughs> yeah, my yeah, response yeah. to that is like an historiographic claim is not true or false any fucking way. <laughs> um, it's, it's, is it useful for understanding the periodization or not? Exactly. Um, yeah. uh, and so, yeah, I mean, we talk about like uh, uh, mission California history. Mm hmm that's latin american history absolutely yeah. but it's also not american history yeah right it's, a, it's american history it's borderlands history it's um you know it's native american Western history it's US spanish history. history right yeah it's all together right i mean for yeah. example for those who know the chumash war just for, for an example are yeah, often miscalled the chumash revolt um <laughs> well i mean it's <sighs> I mean, that's the historiography of it as far as like, you know, it's only recently in the past 20 years that anybody's been calling that uh, what happened a war, you know. Um, and so, you know, what it, like the old history, I mean, in the 70s and the 80s, I mean, this was a well-known um, occurrence. There was hi historiography. There's historiography of the late 1800s about what they called the Chumash Revolt or the Chumash Rebellion. Um, and basically in 1824, um, just about 10 years before the Alta California missions would end, um, the Chumash led the largest armed rebellion against the California missions, not um, the, you know, if we, not if we consider the entirety of mission history. Um, but yeah, it was called for years by scholars, it was called a rebellion, a revolt, an uprising, um, you know, but only recently would we frame it as a war, um, which, which I, I think it, it should be. Um, but it's really interesting just to consider the historiography of the California missions for a second, because, you know, they've, they've kind of become like a flashpoint with Juna Priscera, um, you know, his canonization and um, the California missions are what they would call Alta California at the time, were like a later iteration of the mission system. Um, most of the missions in Central and South America, they go back to some late 1500s and throughout the 16 and or uh, 1700s, maybe not late 15, um, but I, I could be wrong about that. But, um, you know, there are missions across Central and South America, Peru. I mean, you know, you, you name it th throughout the Spanish Empire, lots of them, lots of indigenous resistance. Um, but the California missions don't really get started till the 1780s or the 1770s, rather the first Monterey and, and Santa, uh, San Diego are founded and then a few more and they kind of add to them, um, over the yeah. years. They're basically extremely right that the, any state in Mexico, be it the, the empire of Mexico, new Spain, ex and any of those prior existing states, uh, for yeah. those of you who don't know, Mexico has been many nations technically. Um, oh yeah oh yeah um uh yeah. well where i'm sitting was was uh, uh mexico and, and and i actually have ancestry that goes to the back to this part of california almost to this time when this when california was mexico um and um it's it's interesting because so the 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 missions of Alta California are Franciscan this is after the bourbon revolt uh the bourbon uh, um uh, reformers and the um, the Jesuit expulsion. So like the Jesuits were expelled um, from in the 1700s. This is like very much enlightenment influence um, on the mission system. Um, and the Franciscans, they maintain colleges uh, in Mexico and, and throughout, you know, some of their missions. And so they were you know, a little more, I guess, enlightened, or for whatever reason, Ju Juniper Sarah, there are a lot of reasons, but Ju the Franciscans were able to jockey into a better position after the Jesuits were expelled. And so they were left in charge of the missions of Alta California. Um, and yeah. Uh, yeah, well, just from my standpoint in Mexican history, I tend to know that the southern half of Mexico tends to be Dominican territory. Exactly. Yeah. And uh, strong Inquisition shit going down there oh yeah um oh, yeah. and well, i read a really good book about that last quarter. yeah 
Yeah. And then the northern half of Mexico slash Alta California slash Baja California slash yep. uh, the, the Del Norte in general. Um, mm -hmm. For those of you who don't know, the Del Norte is basically Utah down through actually further down than we probably would go today. It get, probably stops around um, uh, Chihuahua, uh, 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 Coahuila, um those desert northern uh modern states and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and mexico i mean and we have to remember like coila used to be tejas coila like it was that was yeah, yeah. one I mean, giant mexican state yeah. uh and i think it's also interesting as you point out to get to california california is settled by the spanish really late like, really late like they, they were basically doing it to head off the Russians because they didn't want encroachment on their silver mines and their mercury mines in northern Mexico and uh, some of what they're cultivating there. And so they just shot up the coast and, and yeah, afraid that the Russians were going to go down from Alaska. Like, yeah, ex exactly. And so they established it. Mon Monterey is where or Santa Cruz is where the Presidio was. Um, and maybe the first mission was uh, Monterey. Um, I. I I'm sorry, my recall isn't perfect, but, um, you know, and, and it's interesting because from the beginning of uh, uh, missions were always targets for uh, resistance or, or the, the, the natives who were bonded to them would resist in many ways. And then the natives who lived in and around uh, uh, the area would often resist in the what? South and Central American context. And that same like from the beginning, like 1785, like 10 years after San Diego's uh, uh you know, San Diego is, uh, you know, established like hundreds of the Indians there just rain down and attack and, and kill the Padre and <laughs> set fire to the mission. Well, let's talk about the mission system a little bit, because I don't think yeah. most people who don't study both late medieval yeah. history, actually, and uh, Latin American studies realize that the indigenous people, when they weren't being outright enslaved, um, mm -hmm. a la... Mm -hmm columbus yes um they uh and and by the way one of the other revolts that's really a war that i think is now called a war is the king the king george's war and in uh in new england um and that's a very bloody war with the indigenous people but that's partly about the enslavement of indigenous people and i think people mm -hmm. often don't know like oh yeah the puritans had slaves they were not black though they yeah. were uh like often the you know uh indigenous captives from various wars in north america or they were uh from the caribbean uh exported out um uh etc yeah. um but the what makes the spanish development a little bit more interesting and harder to deal with from our standpoint uh and for those listening there's just a cat that's what you're hearing um <laughs> that's totally okay I, yeah. animals are always welcome on the show Very um cool. uh talking uh, about the, sla the slavery and the missions that question yeah well the, the missions uh the, when the indigenous people weren't outright enslaved they were basically bonded serfs they were bonded and, serfs. It was a it was a medieval institution. It was very much a feudal institution, um, and, and that's what um, you know. Because there is a lot of scholarly debate about was it slavery? Are these just plantations with bells on them? You know, and um, really, there there's uh, especially like once you get like Native American um, historians and and activists um, involved. I'm um, trying to. Well, I, Honestly, a, it gets hard to even new... talk about whether or not serfs were slaves too. Like that's well, like yeah, a big, yeah. a but, big question. So, so, but even there's differences in between like, like the 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 material economy or the the uh, 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 political economy of the Alta California missions and the the um, the missions from prior in Mexico, South America, Central America. Um, you had other institutions like. Uh, was it the encomienda um there you know they basically had like a plantation system where at any time someone from around the surrounding area could come to the mission request a one of the bonded indians to the mission and request their labor and and it was it had to be you know they had to be provided you know the the, yeah, the missions acted as hubs um not just of you know commerce and trade and travel and and a, and a pit stop uh, but they would provide the labor to the to the people around that necessarily wasn't the case 
uh, in Alta California, where um, it was more that the 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 bonded the people bonded to the mission worked at the mission. They produced goods at the mission, agriculture, animal husbandry, crafting, um, and then those were sold from the mission. And the mission was its own kind of um, you know economic engine. Um, so, and yeah. They, you know, they weren't getting paid. Their labor was uh, forced and coerced. Um, they were required to labor, however, you know, however long. But they did have paseo. You know, they did have weeks away from the mission where they um, something that is kind of true across mission history is the missionaries like grip on the indigenous people is always tenuous. Their their religious indoctrination is like what one um, Franciscan talked about. It's like held up by tax. You know what I mean? It, any moment they'll they could just revert back to their way of living or their or their their social structure or, or um their traditional life ways so you know after a a harvest they would get like a summer vacation and and get to go off into the mountains or go to some of the villages you know now you know that that's that doesn't sound like chattel slavery but at the same time they were expected to come back um and they were expected to um you know, stay on the missions or, or they, they, they're just all these different things where you, you might, you might say, yes, strictly speaking, the, the uh, Franciscans were not waging a genocide against indigenous people in California, but they were concentrating the population on the missions and required that and required people to concentrate there. Um, and that, that uh, only made the population loss from communicable disease way worse. So it was functionally genocidal. You know what I mean? So it's like, it wasn't, it wasn't chattel slavery. It's still bonded serfdom and, and coerced labor. But again, it's like, it's complicated. It's um, well, I mean, I, I think this complication and I say this again, when people not knowing history, like opens up when you know the history of Europe, yeah. um, uh, yeah, exactly. Because the difference between a slave and a serf is minor, and in early periods, there is none. Um, yeah. yeah. Uh, as through the medieval period, this shifts, and basically, um, serfs have more and more rights. You can't really call them slaves. They have, but they don't have freedom of movement. Um, yep. They don't yeah. have. They're not entitled. They're entitled to some of the fruits of their labor, not all of it, and they're not paid. Like they're yeah. not. They do not earn wages, and they don't uh, have really have justice. They don't have any sense of justice. They can't like they can't uh, appeal their grievances. If the Lord comes and you know, uh, you know, rapes the daughter, then there's nothing. There's no recourse for that. Um, the recourse same... is appeal to the king, and, and the and the appeal to the king is, hey, if you do, if you let these people do more of this, we might revolt. Um, yeah yeah exactly and, uh, and the mission system when people want to understand like why did new spain not become what north anglo north america became and it's not because of uh you know, like the spanish are inferior it's that the structures they brought over were more medieval and they maintained a medieval type economy for far longer Totally. Than than the the Anglo North Americans, and that meant that reinvestment did not go into production; it went into military arms and the church, uh, which is also why anti clerical sentiment when it erupted. I mean, from the Chumash War, but even in Spain, like a hundred years later in the Crisera War and after in the the other Mexican Revolution. Mm -hmm. um, uh, it, it leads to really interesting tensions because one of the things you wouldn't expect, given how nasty um, the the church was to indigenous peoples, I mean, and, and the Franciscans are bad. The Dominicans are really, really bad. Yes, yes. Uh, and the Jesuits are so bad they kick them out. Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, you know, and I, I know today we always think of, oh, the Jesuits. I'm like, yeah, the Jesuits are a liberal force in the church now. Today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they might be that way now. Yeah, with the, the woke pope or whatever, hippie pope you yeah. want to call them. Right. No, uh, not the same. Yeah, they've been kind of like the, the 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 progressive end of the church with the Franciscans for about maybe eighty years, but in yeah. the 19th century, they are not the progressive end of the church. Yeah, um, yeah. everybody's afraid of them actually, and like they're yeah. secretly trying to control everything, um, yeah. In yeah. including other Catholics. So that's something <laughs> to like uh, keep in mind. And um. I, I mean, it's also interesting today because in southern Mexico, despite all that oppression, 
the Chrysera War is actually opposed by indigenous and mestizo peasants, uh, mm -hmm. which is interesting given how much the church fucked with them. Um, and in earlier time periods, they are the first people to fight the church because the church was the 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 main institution of bondage in a lot of ways um, yeah. for a lot of these indigenous groups. And and in this case, in the in the mission system, literal bonded labor. I mean, they yeah. Once they, you were baptized, you're on the hook, man. Uh, you you're that you belong to the mission. Uh, they will ride out and get you if you try to run off. Fugitivism was um, a big problem. And I mean, so, I mean, there's a lot of uh, ways we could approach it. But like, essentially, the, the Chumash War, I'm kind of formulating this idea of thinking about the Chumash War, which um, some scholars very recently have kind of talked about, um, which is just like the idea that when the Chumash War happens... For anybody who doesn't know, the Chumash War happened in 1824 at this constellation of missions. It's actually in uh, my home county, Santa Barbara County, Mission Santa Barbara, Mission San Inez, Mission La Parisima de Concepcion. Um, that's in near present day Lompoc. Um, there's just like a lot of a lot of really interesting detail we could go into. Um, but the Chumash, before contact, were able to maintain like linguistic ties and trade networks across thousands of miles of coastline from like present day Ventura up through San Luis Obispo, um, you know, Santa Barbara, San Luis Obispo, Ventura counties. Um, you know, Mission Santa Barbara was established first, and then they expanded inland over the mountain range to San Inez and La Parisima. Um, and, uh, when the re revolt happened, it started at San Inez, but it quickly spread to Santa Barbara and La Parisima. Um, there was basically mass, um, uh, uh, absconsion or whatever from San Inez and Santa Barbara. They abandoned the mission rather than trying to hold it. Um, hundreds held La Parisima for more than a month. And that's where it's like super cool, super militant. They're cutting gunner holes in the side of the... <laughs> you know, where the, whatever, in the side of the tower and the walls and they're building palisades, getting ready for, you know, they know there's going to be a battalion coming. Um, but hundreds more, like thousands, more than a thousand, um, just flee inland. They just head inland across what today is like Los Padres National Forest. And they make their way out towards like Bakersfield, um, Buena Vista Lake, it was called. And they, um, they, you know, they basically return, uh, they, they meet up with friendly Yokut. They return to a lot of their traditional, um, you know, life ways, they're basically surviving in a marshy lake, you know, and, um, you know, the, so the, when the Franciscans and the, uh, it's interesting because the Franciscans and the Mexican military are, it's very Rashomon, they're pointing fingers at each other, you know, um, uh, uh the Franciscans want to blame this new secular state for all of their problems. You know, the soldiers are so mean to our Indians, not us, you know, the soldiers are like these, you know, these damn hippie Franciscans can't keep these savages in line. But then the two are working together to kind of enact this counter-revolution when they have, uh, you know, first at La Parisima by putting down the revolt, public executions, you know, the whole the whole deal. Um, but then they have to go inland a few months later um, and return these hundreds of people back to the missions, back to the labor regime. Um, and so the Franciscans and the Mexican military do this hand in hand. But even in that moment, there are hundreds of Chumash who probably just fled or, or we know fled even further inland. Um, and so, you know, in some degree, you know, they, those folks were successful. They, if they were never returned to the mission, but from then on, this is, uh, uh, uh from then on until there's also the Stanislaw uh, revolt some years later, but, but from then until the, the, um, 1830s, when the missions are completely secularized across all to California, um, you know, it, it's just basically everybody, anybody on a mission knows you can flee inland to the interior and you're going to find friendly Indians who are, uh, you know, just resisting the missions. You know, the missions were hugged the coast, you know, because Spain was a maritime empire. And so through, you know, the, this, there was rampant fugitism in this last decade of the uh, mission period. And I think the Chumash war, I mean, being right smack dab in the middle of the Alta California mission system, Central Coast, halfway between, you know, the Bay and LA and uh, Southern California. Um, I mean, it was debilitating, and the, and, the, and then the Franciscans are in constant paranoia since then that there's going to be another revolt, and they did have lots of revolts. You know, um, there was a revolt early on at Mission San Luis Obispo 
where the Indians set the the roof on fire. This is before the True Mass Revolt, where they they set the um, the thatched hay roof on fire, and after that, because that that was you know became such a concern, they introduced Spanish tile uh, to San Luis Obispo. So the Spanish tile that we see everywhere in California uh, in our architecture is based off of counter revolutionary uh, tactic, you know, by by the uh, the Franciscans. So it's interesting because there was there was. It was there was some element of a constant state of uh, um, I don't know uh, s slave societies or societies with slaves. That's another debate in history. But just this idea of like a militarized culture, the 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 um, or or a a, a a a society that's at war, you know, all the time. Or a, 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 I, I don't know how how to uh, word it um, the best way. But um, basically, this idea that at every mission there were soldiers stationed. And and like you said, they were producing when the missions first started, they were subsidized by the crown just to have some kind of established, you know, just to uh, just put a little toe out there. Um, and then the missions acted as before they could get the presidios built um, or after the presidio was built, they're supporting the presidio with food, with goods, with clothing, with um you know hides um but also just this material production has a massive um, effect on california and changes things in a huge way for um the indians but i don't know where well i mean this is interesting there. because uh the chumash revolt also happens in the context of um the mexican war of independence which yeah. was not even totally settled it wasn't with... even over, yeah yeah, when when this was going on, I mean, because people who don't know, Mexican War of Independence formally starts on September twenty seventh of eighteen twenty one. Hidalgo, um, yeah, uh, Hidalgo, it, Hidalgo Revolt is the Franciscans when they bitch about it. They go, "This damned Hidalgo Revolt." Right. Uh, it really kind of begins in eighteen ten around September sixteenth. Um, it, so it'll last eleven years, much longer than actually the U.S. Uh, War of Independence, um, yep. and. However, the the uh, the church is functionally uh, operating, still taking orders from from Spain and Rome. Spain. Yep. Um, it was almost and, like the missions because it was a frontier institution, and they knew that you know the Mexican government knew that they needed these frontiers institutions. They were they were tolerated almost like a Spanish embassy or consulate or something. You know what I mean? They were like little relics of old Spain that they tolerated but um the 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 goal was always to for the mexican government was always to secularize the missions and then um you know there was the promise that they would give the natives the, some land of the, some of the mission land hardly any of that happened um and if it did it was was not very good land at all i was about to say that uh the and and what is it eight it's in the 1830s i think it's 1834 35 um mm -hmm. the uh mission system is 34. Yeah, formally taken over by the Mexican government. Um, yep. Secularization. Um, and uh, so one of the interesting things about that is while there was some land promised, uh, initially uh, indigenous were driven off the land or they were literally moved from serfs into true slavery for people who don't know uh, mexico yeah. does outlaw slavery way before the united states but not yet um so it's so a lot of the chumash were enslaved um mm -hmm. which they more or less were beforehand but now they really are um and um uh they're, they're given like a small piece of land and i think it's what like uh that's so that is that is like specifically one group, the San Inez Valley Band of Chumash Indians, mm -hmm. who can can trace back to Mission um, San Inez. But there are other um, there are other bands that aren't necessarily nations. Mm -hmm. um, you know, uh, um, some 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 uh, uh, groups go by which mission they were from. But there's Ventureño, there's um, Barbareño, um, Purismen. Porisi, you know, they're based off of, of uh, which missions are at, but the San Inez one is here in Santa Barbara County. It's down the highway, whichever, I can't remember the highway from um, present day Mission San Inez. Um, and, you know, it's uh, the true mass today, there's, I, they're like piecing together their language from 
uh, they're, they're trying to re- revive their language, which died. Um, there are recordings by a guy named uh, John Harrington. He was an ethnographer in a, uh, um, early 20th century. So there's all these no Latin relation cylinder. to that, that other Harrington. But anyway, go which ahead. which I, I'm not <laughs> sure which one you're saying. Yeah, but um, yeah, he he Michael had, Michael Harrington. Oh, okay, no, yeah, he <laughs> he had a lot of recordings of indigenous people across the U.S., but tons of Chumash. Um, and there's actually two accounts of the Chumash revolt that come from people who didn't live through it, but who, you know, are the generation after or grew up around people who lived through it. And we have their account of it um, from the early 20th century. Um, uh, you know, but I I am trying to reach out um, to the Chumash and I have heard from people loosely here, here and there who say they have family or ancestors who were involved in it. Um, but um it's yeah, I mean, just, nobody would be alive who was involved in it, but yeah. No, of course. Know. 1824, 200 <laughs> years ago this year. 200 <laughs> years ago this year. But I, but I mean, you know, I mean, that that's another thing in history. Like, um, you know, if, uh, uh, like this idea of if somebody's been silenced, if we can't hear from it, I think there's all I've been able to find so far that are direct accounts from Chumash um, regarding this conflict, because a lot, because a lot of the documents of mission history were lost in the Great San Francisco Fire, unfortunately. Um, but what what there is from this time, there is um, an interrogate. There are two interrogations of Chumash men um, that are captured when they're when they're inland near Bakersfield, trying to return uh, them. But those are just interrogations. You know what I mean? And so that's like that's about as direct of a source as we get from Chumash of the time. And then everything else is just through the, the lens of what the Franciscans said happened, what the soldiers said happened, what, um, you know, what, what people who, you know, there, there's histories of, of the rebellion written in the late 1800s by Californios, you know, um, writing their memoirs, you know? And, yeah. and so there, there's a lot of interesting, um, you know, d- depictions and, and discussions around it. But for me, what's super interesting is just, um, you know, because a lot of mission history has asked this question, like, what, you, if it's not slavery, why did the why did Native Americans go to the missions? Why did Indians go to the mission? Were they forced to, to go? Were they rounded up? Um, were they compelled? Were, you know, was it a choice? Um, All of the above? Like... Yeah. Yeah. In, in the 90s, you know, it, it always like matches what the historical movement is. In the 90s, there are people like just all about the environmental history, you know what I mean? And which is good, but then, but if you're going to just look at environmental history for this rebellion and ignore the political history that's swirling all all around uh, uh, these people, then, uh, you know, it's, it's incomplete. Um, well, but, let's talk about the, who the Chumash are a little bit. For those of you who don't yeah. know, they're, they're uh, uh, indigenous uh, grouping uh, loosely in, um, Coastal California. Coastal California. Um, they yeah. speak a language that's lost, but is related to the Takik languages, which are themselves a subset of the Uto, Mexica, or Uto Aztec uh, languages. I don't like the word Aztec because it's actually incorrect. Um, mm-hmm. uh, but anyway, um, uh, for those of you who don't know that the indigenous histories of the American West, the the Mexica or the Aztec actually aren't, aren't aren't originally from Central Mexico. They're actually probably from um, uh, the 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 greater uh, desert valleys around um, now uh, Utah, um, uh, Arizona, New Mexico, and yeah. um, Eastern California, Northern New uh, Spain, yeah. right. Um, and that they were themselves settler colonialist. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, pretty intense. Uh, uh, Central American uh, uh, pre-contact history is is um, yeah, Chichi Mex and, and everybody. Yeah, everybody. It's uh, it's well, dead I mean, too. It's actually that, but I think it's to bring up why it's really important for people to know this. A lot of people think, oh well, the Spanish one because they were more technologically advanced than the Mexica or the Aztecs. Bullshit. Bullshit. Um, yeah, like they won because the other tribes hated the fuck out of the Mexica because they were literally yeah. eating them. Yeah. And like um, the other tribes signed up with the conquistadors, not realizing what they were signing up for. Like, yeah. And not realizing that they were picking up communicable, communicable pathogens, um, not realizing. So it, it's interesting because um, in 
Central and South American mission history, um, you have like once uh, uh, you like you have this mass population loss. Um, but after uh, a century or more of missionization across Central and South America, the population kind of plateaus, the population loss plateaus and you have much more, uh, uh, you know, native peoples, um, you know, having or what miscegenation or whatever it was, as it was called you know um spain uh, uh the spanish culture compensates this for this with its complex weird um caste system um and uh but as you know once the native americans get enough time to develop some skill on horseback get some metal tips for their tools <laughs> um you know the the uh the the plants and animals that Spain brings over are massively disruptive to uh, the e ecology of any area. You bring sheep and goats and cows and horses to an area, these ungulates, um, they're going to, they're going to rip up the vegetation. So, you know, these natives start compensating by, um, you know, capturing horses. And, and this is a very much like against Spain's interest. This, these are their, this is their, you know material product right so they 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 do not want that to happen but you know a, a a an indigenous group in central or you know south america can make use of their terrain the tropical terrain the mountainous terrain steal a bunch of horses get competent on them on horseback um you know steal enough from the missions attack the mission sack the mission steal enough from them go to another area trade for some metal uh, tip tools and then go back and do it again and kill even more people right so there there's constant resistance um and and the natives adapt you know over time because well, go ahead no and the mashika like the mashika loss case I, i've mentioned this before there's three things that cause the mashika to lose one communicable yeah. diseases and that by the way that is why north america also did not turn out like africa all right um because otherwise the populations would have dictated this was the decimation of the settled peoples in the East coast of North America was, and we're learning this from genetic evidence. Uh, we used to think that the English were like lying about finding cities that were empty. No, they no, were not. No, they, they were, were not. They were not. Um, yeah. It's more like we've always heard 50 to 60 or 60 plus percent. It was like close to 90. I, I mean, it's in the eighties and the nineties percent. A population loss i mean what uh, this is the thing about the missions too so, so some of the patterns that happen in central and south america they repeat in california but in some ways they're even it's it's even worse uh, from an ecological standpoint because um a lot of the plants and and of course the animals that spain brings with them whether again like it, it could be um consciously they're bringing sheep and goats and and cows which, in, which are going to decimate the grasses um or eat all the acorns like they bring wild pigs or goats they eat all the acorns the chumash subsisted uh, if they weren't living out of the ocean they were living off the acorns all around them scattered all over the place all over the you know the the floor that's were just surrounded by oaks and they were grinding up um acorns after a few decades of spanish um incursion you know uh, um like there, not only are the majority of your population getting sick, but the over, over time and it gets precipitously worse over the years. Um, less of the food stuffs that you, as an indigenous person, were used to finding, you're finding less and less of them. You know, all these uh, animals are, um, you know, incurring on your traditional foods or or even other animal foods that uh, you might enjoy. And then you're also, if you do kill one and eat one, uh, the 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 Spaniards, the soldiers might come through and whip you for it. Or you might just get sick from that goddamn animal, um, you know, exacerbating all these other problems. I was, I was just reading um, a book called Children of the Coyote by Stephen Hackle. And he calls this across California, he frames it as a dual revolution for Indian people. Like it was at the same time they're being attacked by pathogens. They are being massively attacked. Um, their 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 ecology, which they've cultivated themselves for years, fire and stick agriculture. You know, the the there was a lot of um, just because they didn't have animal husbandry, or um, you know, when I think it was Portilla first came through Santa Barbara in like the late 1500s or early uh, 
whatever the first Spanish, you know, uh, excursion through here, the Chumash gave him more fish than he could eat. They were throwing it out, you know, uh, um, dried fish, that is. And so, you know, they, uh, but they didn't need animal humbustry. They had agriculture, aquaculture already. Like totally had aquaculture. The, so the Chumash also are fascinating because they had plank canoes, they had a very strong maritime culture. They were hunting porpoise and whale in the in the Santa Barbara Channel. You know, and yeah. again, like you can, um, there are archaeological sites, you know, many miles inland, you know, more, at least a hundred miles inland in the mountains, and they're filled with mussel shells. And, and, you know, the, the Chumash used to shell uh, bead currency, um, you know, so like the, you have these, these waves of disruption to their way of life. You know, it's it starts with disease. They, they populated the the Channel Islands for quite a while, uh, or, or that's some of the earliest human remains in North America are, are the Chumash on the Channel Islands from like sixteen thousand years ago. Um, and uh, you know, they were able to like, thrive also, out there, thousands of them for for you know millennia. There's also indication that in this Channel Island stuff, they may have actually come into contact with Polynesians, like. Uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, we don't know yeah. that, and that's speculative. It's based off of the plank canoes because other indigenous tribes in the area don't have them, and that there's some superficial similarities in the word uh, in, Poly in in Polynesian languages for the plank canoe and in Chumash. Yeah. Um, uh, we don't have any other evidence. So I don't, before I got people at me that I'm saying like we don't know, but. Mm -hmm. They were clearly an extensively traveled seafaring culture on plank canoes uh, yep. uh, very early on. So, yeah, they don't need animal husbandry. They got fish. And, yeah, they and, got and and mussels and, and clams and dolphin and <laughs> gray whale, white whale. I mean, uh, blue whale, gray whale, if they could take them down. And and they could. And they did. You know, so we, we have um, a lot of the tools they made out of, out of, you know, bones. I mean, they had they had a very... Like thriving material culture and even like the spanish took notice there was i can't remember um there was some like span span it spaniard uh theorist who had, hadn't been to any of these places but he was reading everybody's accounts like at the time and he kind of he had these tiers of ideas of savagery and c civilized sav savage savages and whatnot and he he kind of categorized the chumash as wow look at how these people live like they they have um you know they they, they had you know political culture they had uh, um, you know, uh, uh, townships, you know, they had, uh, uh, methods of managing population in, in their towns, like expanding things if they needed to, um, you know, and, and uh, you know, I'm trying to think like they, they, you know, they had sweat lodges, you know, they, they had a lot of material culture that just made sense. It, it's a very comfortable environment. So there was a lot of abundance here. Um, you know, there were certain social things that freaked the Spaniards out, of course, you know, the, we have some of the early, um, you know, documented transgendered people or were found, um, transgender women in, or double spirit as, you know, as they were called or whatever, this freaked the Franciscans out that biological males would be living among the females and doing, uh, or doing the women's work uh, as they saw it, you know, um, you know, so there's just like th this, uh, and again, they, they, they were able to keep linguistic and trade connections across i mean you know it takes hours to drive it on the 101 <laughs> you know what i'm saying like uh 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 from ventura through santa barbara up through the central coast all you know hugging uh, um, point conception and and you know on the channel islands you know up to san luis obispo and that's where the esalen kind of uh begin up there so you know and again like maintaining uh trade ties and at least when the rebellion happens too, when the Chumash rebellion happens and they're holding La Parisima, the call goes out across central, uh, you know, California and, and, and or uh, and you know up and down the coast. And there were there were some of the scholarship shows Indians arriving from other missions, from other groups, from other tribal groups, and who just saw that the, the Chumash were waging a war against the Spaniards. They're trying to get the Spaniards out of our land. Let's do it. Let's join them. You know? Yeah. So. Yeah. It's we yeah. May it's, have it, made a mistake a hundred years ago, siding with the Spaniards against Mexica. Let's let's kick these bastards out now. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, uh, yeah. And, you know, it, it's it's interesting. The missions enticed indigenous people with their material goods. You know what I mean? The the um, the Franciscans didn't just 
immediately brutalize you know whoever they saw so you know there, there was curiosity about them a really interesting thing about um there was one as our uh, uh, article i read about mission santa barbara where they ordered like more uh sewing needles you know that they, they're like putting in an order to spain or whatever and then can we get some of this can we get some of that and we're gonna need like more than a thousand sewing needles and the whole reason for that is because the chumash had their bead um their shell bead culture and they would use those needles to drill a little hole in the shell and feed feed some kind of whatever through to you know bead them um and so like they you know the 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 franciscans were doing what they could to entice the uh the chumash or the the indians to to get on the missions and then once you have as well like hackle would say this dual revolution of everybody's getting sick everybody's dying we can't find any food anymore right <laughs> so you know what, what else it's it's a pragmatism you know what what else can we do um and and even so so this is where um i i get interested by subaltern theory and they're they're in the 90s, there was a movement called New Mission History, which was really seeking to give the Native Americans voice, uh, you know, talk about their agency, talk about, uh, you know, because they've been they've just been ignored in the historical record. You know, a lot of a lot of historians of the early early hit mission historians are Franciscans, you know, um, uh, oddly enough a lot of them stationed at mission Santa Barbara, Zephyr Engelhart, um, Maynard Geiger. Um, these were guys who maintained the, the Santa Barbara has an archive. that's still maintained by the Franciscan, by, by the Catholic church. And so, um, you know, these historians, uh, depicted, Oh, well, look, this is what the Franciscans wrote. Everything was fine. And they, uh, you know, they all celebrated the new mission and, you know, they, they write more about, you know all the stuff and the building of the structures and they do the indigenous people new mission historians try to address that even now like the latest uh, uh kind of look at some mission history that kind of builds off of new mission history is okay we understand like you know in a subaltern way looking at the natives but what about the franciscans uh uh you know can we it's okay to ignore them for a bit and focus on the indigenous, but what about them together, them interacting, the Franciscans interacting in between the indigenous and the crown, you know what I mean? Or, or, or the local secular Mexican military, you know, as all of these different groups jockeying um, for position. It's super fascinating. Like there's, there's just, there's a lot to it. Well, you know, when we talk about understanding um, uh, the, one, I think uh, our theoretical frameworks actually matter because they give yeah. us our way to talk about this. So, like, uh, I'm a big believer in um, using some world system language and, and talking about settler patterns. Um, I actually yeah. am not so keen on turning settlerism into, like, a pure way to talk about contemporary politics because it's confusing but we do have to acknowledge that that is what birthed this world here in the americas totally. um uh but also like just in the way just to bring up all the stuff you need to know to really like understand this if you're say a journalist reporting on on indigenous issues in california today uh mm -hmm. you need to know the history of medieval feudalism the church's relationship to that. Why Why were the Spanish more feudal in their organization than the English? What was the result of uh, smallpox and other viral and bacterial infections on North America? How bad was the decimation? To know that, actually, you can't even rely on written sources. You actually have to look at genetic data. Um, Archaeological evidence. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, you need to know... Um, constructed linguistics. I mean, one of the things I said, Chumash was a Uto Aztecan language. That's actually, uh, that's, you know, something that I thought was true. And now I'm double checking as we're talking. I'm like, yeah, well, yeah. I don't know too much. About be, that. Yeah. But there's yeah. other theories as to what it is. <laughs> so yeah. like, um, uh, you know, and, and look, I don't think any one person as a journalist can ever know this. This is why, I know we're all turned off by discourse communities because people <laughs> use that language to ill intent in the 1990s and early aughts to make mm -hmm. us all good liberal subjects. But in a sense, uh, this cannot be handled by one author or person. You need collective history doing collective work to construct an understanding of which a journalist could 
take account. And you know, you you we were joking uh uh um in in chats back and forth with each other. I was like, yeah, and the Chumas War gives us a chance to talk about wow journalism needs history and you kind of also joke back and history does need journalism too mm -hmm. um and i think it is super important for us to understand to construct an image of this events we need the franciscan tr things we need the the news as un was was going through mexico and new spain uh, we you need, need the ethnography of the indigenous people. You need social history. You need environmental history. You need epidemiological history. Uh, you know, you you need um, understanding agriculture. Understanding, um, I mean, to, just like the 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 social the the social history is really fascinating too, uh, especially because you're looking at the Franciscans trying to apply a social program as well as a labor uh, that's tied to their labor regime. You know what I mean? And then, and then you have all the material reality that's um, swirling around that. You know what I mean? And honestly, you need to know religious history because there is a religious yeah, reason that yeah. leads to some of the differences in co and settler patterns yep. between the the new spain regions and the anglo regions and the french regions of north america the french mm -hmm. the spanish were much more willing to intermarry um yes yeah uh then then uh the protestants were uh yep. and also even though this was corvée labor at best if not outright slavery and in some cases it was undeniably outright slavery um mm -hmm. This is this is interesting because you, you mentioned earlier that the that the missions were futile, right? And um, there's been some interesting historians who've talked about how the 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 mission itself is a European institute. It's like it's like you know it, it reminds me of like sealing wax or whatever. You know, you push your crest in, into the wax. That's it's like the rubber stamping this uh, uh, feudal European institution out in the middle of nowhere. Um, and even if you have, you could have a hundred years of indigenous people attacking the mission and resisting the mission and, you know, uh, doing what they can to subvert uh, the goals of the missionaries. But anybody who get, gets into that mission and is, and is bonded to it becomes baptized. And then if they get married, that, that's, you know, they become married and that's documented. And then they produce kids who are baptized under there. Like it, it reproduces these Christian, um, you know, and, and and as far as like like you said, intermarriage, like the, the um, I, I would say colonial Spain showed a, um, you know, there was a lot more. Oh, I don't. I mean, in some ways, like you said, with the Dominicans and, and I the mean, more... there was no compromise. But but in other ways, the, the, there was this compromise with just the the reality. Like they're like, well, there's no other way. We we have to let Spaniards um, intermarry with non Spaniards because they just we don't have the numbers of Spanish women here. So we just, you know, uh, but, but we want to, they, they wanted to Christianize those people because they wanted to, you know, have them in this labor, um, you know, in, in, in this labor system. And of course, Christianity teaches that you just need to work because it's good for you. And, and that's what the Lord wants, you know? Um, so I, and, yeah. go ahead. No, I mean, but but, and I, I think you're absolutely right about that. However, we should also point out that it ends up being markedly less brutal in some ways than the Protestant form of the same thing. Uh, sometimes, and I, I'm going to put an emphasis on sometimes because when Spain goes brutal, holy shit, do they go brutal? Like, well, that's uh, the thing. Like the Spanish Black Myth, right? There, it, in historiography, you know, Protestant and, and um, you know English. Uh, historians take like the accounts of Bartolomeo de las Casas and and other early Spanish um, accounts of the brutality of the Spanish Empire of Columbus, and you know it was this um, kind of uh, white man's burden style. Well, well, look, look, our arms might be bad, but look at what these 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 Spaniards are doing. And I mean, and that's where a lot of like. Um, you know, North American racism towards Central and South America is like, oh, well, those, yeah, they, they might act like they're Europeans, but we all know they were interbreeding. We all know they're, you know, they're, they're, that, that, that. Yeah, they were feeding their indigenous to, I mean, I remember being taught yeah. this, honestly. Like yes. In the 1990s, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, yeah. The Spanish were feeding their indigenous to dogs, which actually in some cases is probably true. Yeah. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Their indigenous also being fucked up, a way to think about it. But that, 
you know, I always used to think, though, my response to that was always like, but why are there way more mestizo than mixed Anglo white people? I'm just saying, like, I know everybody claims to be uh, probably a relative of a Cherokee or something, but we don't look like it. Um, yeah. Yeah, 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 and yeah. Uh, they do. Um, yeah. So, yeah. And, and even as a high schooler, I would just remember like, isn't this transparently obvious to everyone else that like they were more willing to intermarry than we were? Like, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, exactly. And if and you're it, not willing to marry and you're not willing to incorporate into your economic, uh, so if you're not willing to do production or reproduction with a group of people, historically speaking, what happens? You kill them. Like that's, ex- yeah. You know, yeah. Or they kill you. I mean, depending on, you know, who's got the, the, the tactical advantage. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and I've cracked uh, Madding, Mattingly's um, An American Genocide, mm-hmm. which is about California. And it's basically as soon as the Anglos take over in California, that's what happens is they just they're not trying to convert nobody. They're just sweeping through, you know, boxing people and kettling villages of, uh, you know, natives and slaughtering them. Um, Cook or, or who or I'm trying to remember. No. I can't remember who famous uh, California explorer, uh, U.S. Um, mm-hmm. you know frontier um, militarist uh, uh, is responsible for some of those r- r- early attacks in, in um, uh, you know in, in the American context. So that's the other thing. The other thing about California history is this area, this state, you know, which is huge, goes through so many waves of change over the last just the last few hundred years. You know, you have. Um, thousands of years of pretty much, you know, of, of indigenous, um, you know, culture. And then, you know, it's uh, the, the, er, the first missions happen in the 1780s, mm-hmm. um, you know, by the, by the early 1800s, there's been mass population loss. Um, the, the countryside is being transformed by grazing animals and those animals come with burrs and seeds like in their hooves or whatever, or the boats, you know, stowed stowed away on the boats are also seeds from other like weedy plants that actually do quite well here in California. So they, they sweep across uh, the landscape and disrupt, um, you know, the, the ecology of the, of the state, you know, hundreds of, or, or sorry, thousands if not a million or more indigenous people are just wiped out by disease um <clears throat> then th- then you have this uh th- these institutions across california the missions which uh you know attempt to inculcate indoctrinate whatever uh indians into this european christian spanish uh you know feudal mode of of operation um you know the the uh, Mexican War for Independence, the Mexican Revolution for Independence, happens in uh, in in the early 1800, 1810 and on. Um, you know the the uh, you know and and every wave of colonization brings in more people. It brings in uh, uh, different conflicts. You know once once you have a a generation of Mexicans in California. They they are um, spiteful of the Spanish and and the crown and 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 then they're spiteful of the missions and the missions are spiteful of them and then you have the the revolution and and they're at war with each other then you have the Mexican American War and California uh, becomes a U.S. state and then you have a widespread genocide oh sorry you know gold is discovered in the state so yeah then we got to really get rid of the indigenous like. <laughs> that's that's when yeah that's when the genocide program. Uh, kicks into high gear and that's when of course it becomes a u.s state gotta get the cold um and you know the, i mean this is i just i mean just think of the the changes in california over the last hundred years silicon valley uh um yeah i mean you know i live in an in you know uh, people like to call this a small town or it's a growing city but this is an industrial valley i live in an ag valley you know and um it used to be ranching used to be cattle ranching that got displaced in the early uh, uh you know in the early part of the 20th century by ve- uh, vegetable agriculture when they developed ice houses those people all get swept up by in the 80s when there's the wine maker movement like in the movie sideways or whatever and then the central coast is hit again now it's cannabis is like coming in and disrupting like the, the ag industry so right and then the illegal cannabis grow in the deep north of california is now like probably opium or something like i i don't yeah, it's not man. opium but but it's not good it's um, not good there's a trippy <laughs> doc on netflix called murder mountain about like about the uh, emerald triangle and whew, man it's wild out there it's, yeah it's i mean wild. i uh i have been 
like studying because I have friends up north of Mendocino and like yeah. looking at one of the things about California is, you know, I knew about part of red state California, which is the greater <laughs> Modesto Valley. And, and then, and then there's the weird bizarro red state land of orange County, but then there's, oh, yeah. it's everywhere, there's man. The Bakersfield? wild. Yeah. There's the wild Arthi. shit North of Sacramento, which isn't even Woo! always red. It's very poor though. And yeah. can be all over the place politically. Um, and people's understanding of California is unfortunately homogenized because that because California is run by the most geron, gerontocratic or gerontocracy form of the Democratic Party. Like even more than New York, the the like the the political machine that literally ran California was mostly established in the fucking seventies. Like and those same people and their immediate descendants pretty much run the state. Uh, yeah, that's Feinstein, yeah. that's Pelosi, that's that was Jerry Brown, the once and future governor of, of California. Uh, and that is Jerry Brown's protege, Gavin Newsom. I mean, like, mm -hmm. um, it, but the actual history, like California, like Texas, like, like a lot of the bigger states actually has micro regions and stuff. It's really important to understand if you're going to yep. fuck with California shit. Like, yeah. Oh, nothing pisses me off more than when people act like they know California. You know what I mean? And and they're talking about LA or they're talking about San Francisco. And it's like California is not one place, man. It's not one place. San Diego is not like LA. You know what I mean? Politically mm -hmm. or or you know, in other ways. Um, the you know, a lot of whatever Central Valley, the inland nothing, empire yeah. is not like LA, you know. Uh um I've spent a little time, you know, uh, haunting around Yorba Linda and Corona, you know, uh, trying to get to the Nixon Library. Um, uh, but I didn't have I didn't have too much luck. But, you know, American conservatism, like, you know, the, as we know, understand it and like, you know, modern uh, second half of the 20th century, modern American conservatism was born in California. Yeah. You know, Reagan would... Ranch is in Santa Barbara. Right, you know, they're, was, they're they're grooming the next generation of of conservatives there, at, you know, as we speak. And, I was invited to a friend to a Reddit exclusive club just in just north of Sanford, um, and <laughs> I got to where a lot of like Black Athena was written there. But you know what was also written there? Um, Milton Friedman, uh, Richard Pipes, and uh, Samuel yeah. Huntington's books. So yeah. like. Yeah. In fact, I got to sit in Richard Pipes slash Thomas Kuhn's office for a couple of minutes. It was very disturbing. Um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and I, I like to tell people, whereas the modern democratic movement, as we understand it, was kind of a compromise between um, the Chicago, New York machine politics and Southern Democrats who could carry... Uh, so, uh, uh, southern states and when the Dixiecrats gave up the ghost about in the like truly gave up the ghost at the local level because people don't see again all the United States is like this and a lot of journalists mm -hmm. don't seem to fucking know it um, mm -hmm. even though we're dealing with recent history like yeah. the, the idea that um, the South has been solidly read because it's been racist um, uh, yeah. which it has been racist <laughs> absolutely mm -hmm. Uh is a total misunderstanding because at the state level, most of the Southern states were not run, run by Republicans until the aughts. Like, uh, because the bitterness about the civil war went that deep. Um, yeah, imagine that. Uh, yeah. Um, and, and I'm also going to say something as a person who, who has always been like the greatest American failure of American history is like, the Hayes Compromise and the end of Reconstruction. All mm -hmm. that said, a lot of their Southern bitterness at the Northeast is justified beyond the ending of the Confederacy because it was turned into a fucking textile mill mm -hmm. um, and an agricultural shit post, uh, which was reliant on black labor, but also on underpaid white labor, which which uh, no one in the Northeast was particularly interested in fixing until the new deal. So um, that, that understanding, if you don't understand that you, you have a hard time understanding like, okay, well, why are there these weird machine politics that are run by the black congressional Congress 
in these southern states that Biden wants to court. Well, because they literally were given to them uh, in compromises with conservatives uh, as ways to gerrymander districts and stuff with that machine being handed over to the conservative wing of the black community in the Democratic Party, largely when they were being defected, when people who literally run their elections changed the, the sin on the end of their name from D to R. Because it wasn't even in, in Georgia, the Democrats didn't lose they just changed their party affiliation when they finally lost the the state house when they fi- when they mm-hmm. finally lost the governorship um yeah. the the same dixiecrats just became republicans like overnight um, yeah yeah they just changed their name yeah man i mean california like like i said you know thinking you know california because you know you you know about whatever uh, like you said, Gavin Newsom or Kamala Harris or Willie Brown or Diane Feinstein, you know, and um, yeah, just like the difference between the Central Valley, California versus coastal California here. Um, versus Bay Area versus deep north versus Sacramento versus versus. Yeah, yeah versus uh, L.A. versus uh, San Diego versus, you know, um, far inland uh, uh, or, or far, you know, towards like the border counties, you know, super rural. I mean, the rural urban divide exists in um, California all throughout it. Um, that's what you have those like secessionist new state people. They want to create a new California or whatever. Um, but um, he, just here locally, like I'm in Santa Barbara County. I'm in Santa Maria, California. This is North Santa Barbara County, Santa Barbara. I mean, I, I, I allude to this in, in, some in my scholarship that I, I when I wrote about the Chumash War, Santa Barbara is home to some of the wealthiest, most powerful people on the planet. It is called the Amer- American Riviera, California's Riviera. It's beautiful. If you've ever get a chance to go to Santa Barbara, you'll have a good time. It's a beautiful, yeah, uh, uh, place. Um, you know, and and I'm in the big flat rancher valley, Ag Valley, at you know an hour north, right at the edge of the county split. The division, the political division in the in this county, has always been north south li- liberal liberals and conservatives. You know, we have North County conservatives. Um, you know, they might be more business class. Uh, you know, suit and tie Republicans. They might be more. Um, you know, spit to spittoon. Uh, you know, fifth generation rancher. Uh, uh, you know, local landed elite uh, could could be you know, uh, um, our conservative like represent representation, but I mean, it's, it's, you know, Santa Barbara is known for, you know, the, the environmental movement and the, the oil spill that happened out there or the, the oil spills that have happened out there and the response, whereas, you know, this Valley that I'm in again, but you know, before it was plant agriculture, there's, it was also an oil field like this. I'm, we're surrounded by capped oil wells. Um, and uh, uh, the the political divide between North and South, when I grew up, there was like a move to split the county. There was a vote of a county split. And it's funny because ever since we got um, district elections, our kind of city politics has changed a little bit. But even then, like Democrats or, or, or you know, more liberal candidates, they're in severe. I see it. They, you know, it's very easy to get captured by Santa Barbara, by the machine. That's where the mach- the, the machine politics emanates from in in this area is from santa barbara and i mean you have like huge donors to the democratic party not just julia louis dreyfus who live in santa barbara you know what i mean uh, um very very important powerful wealthy 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 people yeah i would tell people if you want to look for like like the the secret valleys of where american wealth is outside of new york um and and uh florida uh, and we talk about why it's in Florida one day, but that's beyond. Yeah. Uh, uh, you look at Woodside, where like the people who are richer than Palo Alto will even allow for, and yeah, yeah, yeah. and you look at Santa Barbara, like, um, and and then you look at like the nice parts of San Francisco and the nice parts of L.A. Um, and this is also why I, I find California's politics actually to be fascinating compared to even Texas. And I find Texas fascinating too. My Texas listeners mm-hmm. don't, don't think I've forgotten my Tejanos out there, but <laughs> um, uh, y'all are weird. But, um, uh, and when I, when I talk about y'all, I have to speak in my native accent, but yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> um, 
Uh, so for the people know that is not me culturally appropriating Texas speak. I'm Georgian. Yeah, you're from uh, Georgia. Yeah. <laughs> um, uh, but uh, California, like political cultures in California, to me, were batshit, and still I started understanding the microclimates and what it kind of said. Because for me, New York is the Democratic Party's past. And I mean that in in the good sense, like they had mm-hmm. like they have municipal policies and stuff set up even before they went bankrupt that have kept the city from having the homeless problem that California has. They have uh, they have infrastructure, social infrastructure left over from after the New Deal and the great uh, and the great society that's been maintained even after yeah. a bankruptcy that has well, never yeah. Yeah. It's never been established in California. California has its own like shitty attempt at a welfare state based on capital gains taxes. But mm-hmm. like, well, um, I mean, we used to have state like mental health facilities, but again, like the birth of modern uh, conservatism happened here, and Ronald Reagan happened here, and he deinstitutionalized the whole state. You know, and and uh, we have one not far from here, Tascadero, like one of the only state hospital uh, mental hospitals that was left, and it's because it's for the criminally insane. You know, or or it's for it's for uh, well, know, criminals, and and so it's just like. And I want to well, also talk a little bit about that, though, because this is yeah. if you understand the history here. I mean, we're talking about history a lot. We we talked about the Chumas War. We'll come back to that. I promise, listeners, you're not just gonna yeah, tramp yeah. all over this. But I want to, but I want to point out that the deinstitutionalization actually kind of started from legit concerns on the left and was immediately picked up by the California right. Um, yep. to have progressives as an ally in finding a way to cheapen it because of uh, deinstitutionalization was kind of a left wing demand at one point until you know yeah, we because saw of the, the conditions right yeah, yeah the conditions were bad agency was disrespected um uh you know um How about gun control you know uh, Reagan and gun control after the the Panthers <laughs> march on the yeah. Capitol. You know, and, uh, and, and like, and, and it's so funny because just like another, just to bring up my my county's example, like, you know, the 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 um the the politics up in North County where I'm at just skews, you know, more conservative. But it is like when people try to say California is, is you know degrowth. Well, where in California is degrowth? Because like, you know, the rubber stamp is heavy where uh, where I'm where I live, and there's development going on all the time. So when people tell me. You know, nobody in California is building is building housing. Nobody's doing. You're wrong. You know, you just you just don't know where it's happening. Um, but you're right. If if uh, I mean, it's just interesting. It's degrowth in the sense that, like, only in the sense that property values in Sandy in uh, in San Diego, L.A., uh, Sacramento, and yeah. well, and Bay have slowed the, a little bit. This is like, the thing. They're not building anything in Santa Barbara. They're not building anything in San Luis Obispo, but. My town is a bedroom community for those uh, for for those areas. I mean, you know the 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 traffic on Highway One at at five o'clock come you know at the end of the day is coming uh, back south to Santa Maria from San Luis Obispo. That's where the the traffic traffic's on that side of the highway. You know, so we are the affordable bedroom community where it was a suburb, but now they're they're building up and um, creating more density. Um, but it's still it, it's still we're we're the place people think of and want to move um because they can't can get, afford can't anything. yeah yeah he, i mean nobody can afford anything um you know it, it's the prices are still ridiculous here in santa maria but at least we have stuff going up and we have a lot of stuff going up so you know it's just one of those things where it's like california is not one state california is um and, and the regional politics you know i mean just like the proximity of a uh, of uh, you know, I'm in between two college towns and just the difference in those college towns, you know, and, and the colleges, UCSB, um, you know, Santa Barbara's college town and, and you know, uh, um, some of the politics, campus politics you see um, and whatnot versus where I go, Cal Poly San Luis Obispo, which is a polytechnic. And you got tons of kids in there who are from, you know, longtime ranch and families and ag business interests. I mean, that, 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 that uh, college is, you know, teaching people aerospace engineering and architecture. That's where Weird Al got his architecture degree. And like the politics on campus 
you know, they have the land acknowledgements and they have this and that, but man, when this Palestinian kids, uh, you know, they got, they got their heads cracked by the, by the campus police, uh, you know, last protest they had and a few of them got arrested like, uh, Oh, because, uh, Boeing or Lockheed was on campus. You know what I mean? And, and they're not going to, you're not going to embarrass us in front of Lockheed at this school, you know, as a, as a polytechnic, uh, you know, so it's like the politics in San Luis Obispo, have the slightest veneer of like progressivism. Look at all our bike lanes, but goddamn, it's like there's a very conservative undercurrent. Um, that uh, San Luis Obispo County is also responsible for a long time held assembly district that dips into my into my into Santa Maria Valley that's been held by Republicans since like forever, basically. Well, uh, well understanding. The, I mean, the, you and I are talking about this in another way, but let's talk about why this is important. Um, okay. Because like, if you're not from California, who gives a fuck? right uh uh except that you want to understand the weirdnesses of the way these large states and you know here we're looking at new york texas uh, california uh and then collections of states the mountain west the south has a block uh mm -hmm. cascadia as a block mm -hmm. um really affect these ideas you actually do have to understand the weirdnesses of local inputs that are affecting the way people are thinking about political economy i'll give you a weird example of that um mm -hmm. you know you're talking about this in uh santa barbara and san luis uh, a piece of santa maria uh, yeah, yeah yeah um i i think about my, my my deep exposure into california culture uh even though i uh you know if i had my way i would break california up into 55 states and yeah you know, like, um, so would you and a lot of other people yeah, yeah yeah um i would blink most of the states up if i'm quite honest and then all in the mountain west i'd be like and in the in the in the and then in the in the, in the, in the, in the northwest it'd be like and all y'all are now one state because there's no reason <laughs> we don't need two dakotas in a montana sorry that's one state yeah. have a nice day <laughs> yeah, um yeah. uh but anyway um <laughs> for administrative positions um yeah. Uh, you have to understand like the weirdness of California politics. Cause mm -hmm. um, I remember being baffled by the fact that agriculture was so powerful in the Modesto Valley mm -hmm. uh, that they didn't meter fucking water until you almost ran out of it. Um, yeah. And I was like, what you don't meter, you don't meter industrial use of water. And mm -hmm. like, even in the, <laughs> Even in the crazy ass east, we do that shit. Like even in the south, like what do you want? Yeah. Uh, and then that started changing. And the other thing that's changed that's made that area real contested is it Modesto, as far out as like Ripon and Modesto, mm -hmm. is now a bedroom community for um, the Bay Area. Where mm -hmm. in the past it wasn't even a suburb of the Bay Area; it was its own little like mini town with some suburbs around it that serve the agricultural valley all the way up to salinas and and to well, that's the thing right Go, yeah right. those areas are under constant danger of getting becoming the 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 new suburb of the hinterland of you know whatever industry you know whatever uh, i mean and that's the thing like you see it around here they're they're trying to entice tech tech people uh, um you know to come here and this, this like this valley is a agricultural you know, it's an, it's an ag Valley, but they, they want, you know, they, they were, I think you know, everybody wanted the Amazon warehouse, but there are other companies that have, you know, uh, um, oh, I'm, I'm thinking of uh, a tech company, mind body that's in San Luis Obispo. I've known a bunch of people who've worked for them. There's call centers here that, you know what I mean? They, they're like, they're always trying to entice that kind of thing. But, but again, like it, it, it's funny to see like my town, my city go from the affordable place to live to, uh, seeing it develop to serve, you know, the college towns on either side, and you know, it, uh, everybody's it's getting harder and harder to afford to live in the city, um, you know, and and yeah, our homelessness has increased, and um, you know, the people living in our river bed, quite a bit of them. Um, if you want to go on a soliloquy real quick, I'll I'll be right back. I got to hit the bathroom. All right, uh, for those listening, because I'm probably not going to edit this out, we took a break, and now we're back. <laughs> um, uh, for those of you who are wondering, why does that matter? It's just an excuse because I'm not editing it out. Um, <laughs> so I think when it comes to indigenous studies and also California, similarly to California, 
um, actually as an analogy as a way to explain this. I hate the way we talk about indigeneity as a monolithic thing. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, the tribes of the of the East, uh, even if you want to call them, like even calling them tribes is somewhat anachronistic. Uh, the peoples of the East versus the peoples of the Northeast versus the peoples of Central America versus the people of the West Coast proper versus the people of the Mountain West. Uh, there are interrelationships, there are similarities and differences, but they are radically different peoples. Um, and um, the response to them was radically different as well. And mm -hmm. one of the things, as a, as a Marxist, one of the things I don't always love when Marxists talk about settlerism is they kind of treat it as a homogenous process or they don't look at, they only look at the English case. They don't look at the French and Spanish case. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the Spanish case is, there's a lot to it. I mean, and the, you know, the, the role of Catholicism and the entire West coast is important because it wasn't just the, uh, the Spanish trying to cut off the Russians uh, from bringing orthodoxy down. And for people who don't know the fourth North American saint, of, of uh, Orthodox Christianity is from Alaska um, and St. Takun and um, there was an Orthodox settler uh, movement uh, that was exp you know expanding uh, into Canada definitely in Alaska um, that was an extension of what was done in Siberia um, and the far and the far eastern of the of the of the Tsarist Empire so like, uh, this was a multi-imperial contestation when the, the English get involved in on the West Coast very, very late, um, mm -hmm. you know, basically through the Mexican-American yeah. War and to some degree through the Louisiana Purchase. Um, but the mission system is also really important in understanding the indigenous system in Seattle, but it's a different uh, are in the in Washington and Idaho, but it's a different in Oregon. It's a different mission system because it's a French version, yep. not the Spanish. Exactly. And yeah. uh, there are differences and they have different outcomes. Um, mm -hmm. And just the difference between all these mendicant orders and the Spanish mission system, whether it's Jesuits or Dominicans or Franciscans or what have you. They had different approaches to it. They some One sect might have a different approach here than they did there. Um, natives here might behave in one way uh, here than that, you know, like in, in, in one place, the Franciscans are well received, like the fact that they're um, ascetics, like, you know, that, that they don't have a whole lot of worldly possessions that does well, that reads well with some native groups, other native groups are like, man, what a bitch, like this guy doesn't even have any gold or anything hanging from him, you know what I mean? So it's like, the, like all of their approaches um, are, are just uh, um super complex and then california is ecologically materially very you know and and you know think of how mexico or spain was behaving in mexico over gold and silver right or, or mostly silver and and yeah i was gonna say know, the, the 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 myth about it being mostly about gold is mostly for tv but it yes it was silver i mean most of the gold that came out of spain uh, that came out of mexico to spain was in the first year it was like everything that aztecs had whereas the 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 real um ore that they were that they were finding and 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 mining in serious uh you know amounts was silver and then you had to have um you know, you had to have mercury mines and salt mines and uh, to process the silver and, the, and um, you know, to, so, you know, in, in some ways, Spain would, they would defend their mercury mines even more um, passionately, <laughs> my cat, uh, they, they'll defend their, you know, mercury mines even more intensely than some other areas, because they know they need those for their silver mines. And if they had known gold was in California, that you know the hills were filled with gold as well you know who knows how different the alta california the 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 um the putsch that they did in the late 1700s like if if it would have been the same if the if the spaniards had discovered gold but it you know it was much too late uh, for them by then yeah i mean this is a you know on one hand i also don't want to like you know cut the catholic church too much slack um Let's not uh, do that. The, the residential schools in Canada were often run by, uh, by, by the French Catholic Church. I mean, like the you know, uh, for the depopulization and settled colonization of, of of the Americas, particularly North America, the Catholic Church mm -hmm. actually has a lot to answer for. It just tended to be 
it tended to perforce. I mean, if, I know this is this this sounds like almost crash to use, but it tended to perforce softer genocide, cultural and or uh, ethnological, but not literal genocide. And so, like, um, they weren't trying to wipe people out. I mean, the, do we have to pat them on the back because they wanted their labor? <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, we, we have to pat the Franciscans on their ba- on the back because they didn't want to slaughter everybody because they really wanted to bond, have them in bonded labor. And, you know, I mean, how... And if they marry some some Spaniards, you know, that's a... You know, they're serfs anyway. I mean, we're not... Like, I don't want to make it sound like also, like, like uh, New Spain was super woke. Like, the no. caste system was, you know crazy actually and it it's and it's a view of race and it led to colorism as like is like the simple the, the like simple residue of the casta system right but like even that's not totally accurate because if you're born from a spanish moor and you're black skinned but you're from the continent and you're in north america you're actually really high up in the casta system uh, even compared to like a peninsularis born white it's it's wild like it's, it's it's very confusing it's um there's also it, like cre- a writ of sangre so you could get a writ of blood so they could literally give yeah. you a white card like, the Dia de sangre. yeah you could yeah. you could you could buy to have your uh blood cleaned um it, and it's interesting because that plays out in the missions too you know you you uh, mm-hmm. mission rebellions you'll have an indigenous californian who's at odds with the military military uh, authority that's present on the missions and they're like a mestizo or they could even be um uh you know like basically joining the military made you a white you know in in their context you could be um you know whichever casta of a, a darker skin uh, casta and then if you join the military you've become de facto white and um so you have these soldiers being like i don't i shouldn't have to do this labor anymore like uh um that was some of what i was reading in the hackle book you know that they they associate well you're the indians you do this labor now we're not uh, we're not anymore we shouldn't be laboring here like this this is this is not work for us and, you know like they, they thought they'd gotten out of that they gotten out of that cast you know and um so the, and and that's a fascinating thing about california history too is is it's spanish but it's also mexican because you had um like the franciscans who were coming up from um, you know, Sarah, uh, but his acolytes and whatnot, they, these were Mexican Franciscans. A lot of them had studied at, uh, the, the, the Mexican, uh, colleges, uh, that, that they had. Um, so, you know, it, it's interesting how in some ways, some, some things that were used in, in Mexico and were central to Mexico, like the encomienda were just like, for whatever reason, were not repeated out in California. Um, but then there were just other factors like, the um the just by coincidence the landscape being a little more hospitable not like totally hospitable but just a bit more hospitable to the spaniards and their livestock and their plants than like certain you know like deep in the jungle of or the Sierra you know, the, madre or any yeah, of those like, like yeah, yeah or in the amazon or whatever you know what yeah I mean? so, or even like in chiapas and oaxaca where you're just like yeah. okay i'm going between desert and rainforests like very yeah. quickly like yeah um yeah. uh, alligators and pythons and and mosquitoes and and yeah. poisonous thing every everywhere yeah no large ungulates like other yeah. than maybe a few deer yeah, um exactly. yeah. Yeah. um you know uh whereas california that we shouldn't we shouldn't overestimate the hospital the hospitality of california's environment no. because like no yeah it's true uh uh, as a person who recently drove from Utah to yeah. uh, <laughs> to Palo Alto and back, the Donner Pass fucking sucks. Sucks, um, dude. Uh, and that, and that's <laughs> but that again, that's why the missions hug the coast. You know what I mean? And that's why the Chumash did so well in Santa Barbara and on the Channel Islands. Like that's that was their source of abundance was you know the ocean. I mean, I grew up I grew up out here. I used to go to Pismo Beach as a kid, and you'd see bubbles in the sand. And you just dunk your hand in there and come up with a clam. Like uh, you can't do that anymore, obviously, because they're they're mostly all gone. Um, but you know, the, the, like there is this area. There is something you know. This, you know, it's it's very. I mean, the Chumash wore hardly any clothes. You know what I mean? They they were very, um, you know, they were very. Like, yeah, the northern bays. It's not the weather's not as unpredictable. Yeah, like, yeah, and and it's not a desert like L.A. 
You know what I mean? Right. We were, we, this is a sweet spot. I mean, it, there's a reason why the richest uh, fuckers in the world want to live in Santa Barbara. <laughs> you know what like I mean? I said, like, yeah, Santa Barbara and Woodside. However, yeah, to put it up, the weather's a little crazier up there uh, in in the North Bay. I mean, so yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and California's weird, even by U.S. standards, because the interplay of coast and mountain and various mountain ranges, including mountain ranges that are underwater, piece. What do you think the Bay Area is? Yep. Um, uh, leads to a particularly strange set of microclimates, even compared to other large states like um. Like Texas has microclimates, but it's nothing like California, where like, you know, like the Bay Area is like weather is almost counter cyclic to nature. Um, <laughs> it's just it, like it's cold in the summer and not yeah, particularly yeah. cold in the winter. And it's just yeah. like, it's yeah. like, what the fuck? Um, Th this area is prone to drought. We've, you know, we're finally like out of our historic massive drought that we've had and that was another thing that like historians tried to argue that the chumash went to the missions because there was drought um you know but it's like that's that's a very simple explanation the chumash lived here for thousands and thousands of years you think they couldn't cope with a drought you know what i mean like uh, um so you know the, it, it's um there just from where i'm sitting i can be in i uh, you know and, and drive less than an hour i can be in sand dunes that don't hardly exist anywhere else like estuaries and sand dunes i can be in oak savannas i can be in uh you know rocket you know uh, uh uh the some of the um you know southern mountain ranges i can be in the mountains um snow capped sometimes parts of the year uh within sight of where i'm at i could drive you know inland and be at in upper desert you know in less than in less than an hour so you know it's it's um and and yeah. these people knew how to navigate it you know they they knew they like it is an interesting thing that the chumash who were some of them during the rebellion hopped in their plane canoes they you know got their old dusted off the plane canoes and went out to chill on the islands while all the the violence was going on but even more people went inland knowing that it was away from the ocean it was away from you know what they're what they were used to living with but they it's interesting that they went to a lake inland and um they they behaved in some ways i've done some study of like slave revolt and they behaved in some ways like maroon colonies in places you know like in jamaica or um cuba or, or elsewhere where they were just so hard to get to and they were living you know whatever it's like rambo style you know the deeper <laughs> they go out into the bush that you know uh, uh that i have you know, I read uh, Mexican soldiers going, fuck, they live out here. They can eat, you know, everything that lives in there. And we're just getting bit by bugs and every, you know, it's, it's, it's different. We can't get them out of there, you know. So um, well, the, the material, the, the, the material aspect of that, that's something that has changed in mission history in the last like 20, 30 years is looking at the material basis of um, and the material culture of, of a native group. Like you said, it could be totally different across different parts of the state, depending on what was available to those people. Yeah, well, this is another thing that, you know, we've been talking a lot about California because that's clearly your passion. Um, that's where I'm from. But, it's easy. It's, you know, path of least resistance sometimes, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm actually, I became obsessed with California the same reason I became obsessed with Texas, although Texas was interesting because I'm like, why are you part of the South, Texas? Um, I don't know that I trust you. Um <laughs> <laughs> I, this whole Republican history you claim to just feels fishy to me. Yeah, um, what's the <laughs> um, uh, and why were you a slave state? Um, uh, but anyway. Well, there's um, a new book that just came out, California, a slave state. Well, the thing is, California kind of was, as was, I mean, mm -hmm. weirdly, like, the southern half of Utah was, which is often not discussed. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah, Southern know, California had it. That's like yeah. It. It's, uh, you know, now, I mean, some of the non-slave slates on the e on the West Coast, not the East Coast, uh, sorry, we get my coast flipped, like Oregon, it wasn't a slave state, but Oregon was a Klan colony. It was a white supremacist colony, big time, <laughs> big yeah, time, like, man. Like, and I say Klan colony, I'm not even joking. Like, that's not like. Go read their uh, first constitution. Yeah. yeah. Go read their first uh, constitution. That was something that bugged me. I finally watched um, Deadwood. And uh, there was a black character in Deadwood who's like, I just want to get out of here and make it to Oregon. And I was like, like no, would he really want to go to Oregon? Yeah, like, I don't think. 
you would have wanted uh, you might want to get out of here and go to california or washington but if exactly. you're going to oregon you, uh, you don't know what's in oregon <laughs> like... so um a professor i study with at, at cal poly named cameron jones dr jones he um he wrote a pretty good mission rebellion book about uh peru the peruvian missions uh mm. rebellion so peruvian missions uh it's called in uh was it in, in um something to two masters or whatever uh, i gotta i feel bad uh, i'm blanking on his um i'm trying to look and find it in, in service of two masters i believe it's called um but he has since like kind of turned his focus more to afro californios like actually uh black californians in california history um because they were here even though they're they're you know not exactly mentioned you have to do some work especially with the castas and all that you know a, a lot of um black people in california would be identified in, under some other designation well, right the yeah this this is also true in mexico where like afro mexicans yeah. is kind of buried because uh yeah, totally because the cast is kind of buries them you have to find you have to trace people back to moros and then figure out if the <laughs> moros are are former muslims or if they're black um yeah. and uh usually they're black but not always because you'll hear sometimes like oh we don't have a lot of africans here and i'm like dude uh, yeah, what? You know, in Mexico, and I'm like, I'm like, dude, have you seen Playblin and Puerto Vallarta cuisine? Like, that's fucking African. I don't know what you're on. Yeah, um, yeah. Uh, like, uh, that's a big, it, that's a big thing. We think we have trouble talking about that here. Um, Brazil, Mexico, that just that history of of slavery, because that's that was part of the castas too. The castas were di di divvying up not just what happens when a Spaniard gets with a with, with an Indian, what happens when the Indian gets with an esclavo or an esclava with a you know what I mean. And so it was like all this. Um, it's a big mess, right? Yeah, and you're right. Like like uh, Mexico didn't outlaw slavery till what the 1840s. I mean, that's kind of what prompts the uh, the Tejas Rebellion, which they invited uh, the the Mexicans invited. Uh, gringos to, they invited gringos to settle um because they didn't have enough people to send north uh and nope. um that was a mistake um <laughs> and uh uh and yeah, then they yeah. outlawed slavery and the, the the gringos were like nah uh <laughs> yeah. uh also, we're not, yeah all of a sudden go ahead we're gonna we're gonna blame the stew for for you allowing the stew to attack us uh and we're gonna use that as a pretext to leave and keep our slavery although even that's complicated because like houston or houston if you want to call him by his corrupted uh Te tejas form of his name um houston is what it originally is and we know that from the street in new york um uh and the county named after him in georgia um it was not a, a pro slavery guy. So like Texas's history is also wildly weird. Um mm -hmm. uh but tied into the same thing um where there's competing settler colonial items basically and then yeah. like they're they're, they're they're Spanish missions in Texas. Right. And then there's uh this need they did the the encomienda system didn't go up that high for whatever reason and yeah. so yeah. They needed other ways to bring industry in that led to them inviting the uh, dissident gringos in and, you know, <laughs> all kinds of haywire ensues. <laughs> um, but uh, uh, my but, favorite is always the San Patricios, but go, but go ahead. Oh, yeah, that's the whole, they're that's fun. The that's just a fun story. <laughs> um, but I mean, one of the things that we have to quit doing in the United States, I think, um, mm -hmm. uh, is yeah, I complain a lot about the United States left doesn't know the history of the United States left before, say, 1965, right? Uh, <laughs> it, like, um, but I also complain a lot that, like, the United States left doesn't understand, like, even when it's adopting, like, settler frameworks somewhat accurately, but using them in this really broad way, that it doesn't understand our interconnections of, of European colonial history, indigenous history, the, the transatlantic world, et cetera, in shaping what this is um, and uh, in creating something like, yeah, whiteness comes from Europe, but my God, the North Americans perfected it because otherwise we were going to have to deal with our ethnic differences and we didn't want to do that. So, um, and whiteness was provisional. You could kick people out or add people in uh, depending. And um, 
you know, how we handle Latin people, even to this day, is tied into that. Um, well, I mean, yeah, uh, absolutely. Like, I live, I live in an ag valley. Um, some of the some of the families that own um, land here in the valley have been here and own that land since it was Mexico or 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 not long right. after. Um, you know, there, there are, there are rancher families here in the Valley that, um, maybe, you know, they, they came up and made money. They came from Mexico not too long ago. Um, or, or, you know, they, they could just be, like I said, descended from people who came out here a long time ago. Um, but you know, like that, like I would see this, I, I noticed this growing up in this, in this Valley, mm -hmm. um, growing up, it seemed more, um, like the dynamic was the, the, the dynamic when, when you were young and, and you learn was, Oh, there's like white people and Latinos in, in the city. There's a lot of Latinos. And, and, but then growing up, I was like, well, you know, there, there's a lot of different, I growing up, I knew kids who maybe their parents were from Mexico. Maybe they were born in Mexico or, but not just Mexico. I knew kids, um, you know, who, who's, them or their family came from Peru or Argentina or Puerto Rico or Colombia. Like I knew a lot. Uh, there's a lot of people here in this valley, but specifically what you see play out in the labor is, you know, you, you, you get to, you know, I, I get to know enough about the city as I grow up that there's a racial caste system in this city where you have in still indigenous, the indigenous people from Mexico um, are here working the ag you know working in the fields working the agricultural industry in the labor and then you were and then you look at the management not so, sometimes the ownership the ownership could be you know white blanco weddell totally the ownership could be mestizo you know or what what we would yeah you know. it could be criollo mestizo whatever for, yeah, yeah. Blanco, I mean, criollo is the, the mexican term there's also that. a bunch of portuguese here in in the valley like it, it takes many many flavors but like you'll see this dynamic of i had i did it on my channel once where there was we had a video from one of the fields where you have a four foot something oaxacan woman who speaks misteco as her first language um as her primary language trying to argue for better pay with a six foot something mestizo guy who's you know looming over her and enunciating his spanish slowly like condescendingly and condescending to her shitting on the way she speaks spanish which is in her first language so like that right there that's the thing you know what i mean like it, it, and you know you look around and and the architecture of municipal buildings uh, government buildings is mission style you know like the you know what we we celebrate spanish settler colonialism in california um you know uh so I mean, just, so, yeah just like texas i mean there's texas in in this way california San is Antonio. actually very similar to your arch nemesis texas um yeah, yeah, yeah. um <laughs> well, a lot of texans it's sad to say but a lot of texans now are embarrassed californians yeah i, yeah. I know a lot of them <laughs> i know and uh, a lot of texans resent the number of embarrassed californians in texas but exactly um, but but then texas actually come to california visit and they oh you know, I didn't get assaulted yeah. by purple haired homeless, uh, you know, whatever, whatever they think is going to happen. No. Um, homeless people have the money for purple hair. Um, but no, uh, uh, I, 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 uh, I mean, I do think they're uh, like California. California's political problems to me actually illustrate what i'm afraid of of the future of the democratic party though and that is okay. that it has fairly progressive policy but can't fix anything for the poor at all like at all, at all. like yeah. like and it has not been able to undo any of the conservatism that was born there even though they run the political machine of the large state like yeah. the micro politics really matters and most people even most californians i don't think know it anymore um, they might know it for their city, but they don't know it for their for like all the regions of their state. Um, yeah. uh, that's also true for Utah, by the way. I mean, like, uh, like California to me is interesting in that California and Texas are the best way to talk about this because they're so fucking big and yeah, so diverse. Oh, yeah. Um, uh, that it's like a hundred million people between the our two states, maybe. Or, yeah, I mean, or, like or, you know, it's a lot I, of Americans. I was talking about. States. I was talking about it like 17% of all economic activity comes out of either um, New York or California. But then if you yeah. add Texas into that, it's like something like 26 or something like it's, it's a lot. Um, yeah. Yeah. 
uh so like three of the 50 states uh really do drive a lot of this stuff um and part of that is by historical accident of of size and ports um more than anything ports. else it's so funny like that that is something i point out to people <laughs> so often is is you know they go man hollywood and, and the bay area it's like man there were two massive shipping ports like it, yeah it all starts there man like that that you know how, how do you get an industry you know to, to to build up or i mean you agriculture is the heart of this state it has been for a long time i mean that that's what the, that's what the franciscans were doing in the missions was agriculture like tens of thousands of goats and sheep and and you know they're growing wheat agriculture and, and logistics that's what yeah, you guys lima do. beans. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Or, or what? <laughs> and land actually, like that's the other thing you got. To do. There's really interesting scholarship about indigenous resistance via, um, a, a, and Spanish Franciscan inculcation via the arts, via music, via paintings, um, via iconography. Um, so yeah, I'm gonna let my Pierre Badu fan ship show up, but I actually have said this. <laughs> so I was talking to a friend of mine actually in Woodside the other day, one of the other yeah. days a couple weeks ago. Um, this is uh, an interest in in my in my uh, in my personal life, but I, I I was you know in this area and I went and looked at my friend and I was like, when did our bourgeoisie become so fucking boring? Um, and and I said that because I'm like. If they're boring and don't understand art patronage, they don't understand social reproduction, which means we're fucked because we have a shitty, blind, futureless, boring ass elite um, that that has come from a particular subset of the bourgeoisie that uh, sucks. And I think you're absolutely right. And this is something Marxists often miss because they, they, they think superstructure means not important. Um, and mm. that, that can be further from the truth. Like even Marx and Engels realize that's a feedback loop. Uh, it's a circle. Yeah. Um, yeah, 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 yeah. um, but, uh, to get into this a little bit more specifically, um, yeah, of course people were competing with the arts. I remember also like the Catholicism is weirdly, um, syncretic and it was in Europe too, but like. You know, the first time you go see the rain dance for Mary with people in like Mexica headdresses in northern Mexico, yeah. you start realizing, holy shit, they were OK with more than I thought. Like as long as you dressed it up in the presence of the Virgin of Guadalupe uh, or um, some saint or as I like to talk about southern Mexico so much, the passion of thunder Jesus, which <laughs> is a real thing. Um yeah, yeah. uh they're like, what do you mean thunder jesus well they got people to convert by uh, yeah. a, a cross being struck by lightning in this area yep. of, a, of a of a sky god <laughs> like totally um, and so like Nailed you it. have the passion of thunder jesus i don't really know how to explain it to you other than that okay. um yeah the uh, uh the the chumash are supposed to have um you know the the, the interesting thing is First of all, the, the syncretism, some, some historians argue that it's been overstated, you know, that like, you know, that I mean, talk about cafeteria Catholic, like picking what you want. You know what I mean? Like the the, the natives, you know, they, they, they were basically it was window dressing. You know, it, the, the parts of Christianity they appreciated the most are what already, like you said, resembled what they already believed anyway. So the Chumash might have been doing a little bit of this and that. You know, I think they might have taken a cross with them or or some of the um, that's another interesting thing in, in, in mission history is the, the, the there's an obsession by the Franciscans on the, all their stuff, all the little Vermonts that they need to, you know, do a mass or do, uh, you know, whatever this right or that. Um, and, you know, the or, or, you know, the Franciscans trying to be good PR uh, campaigners, as they were, may, make a big point to say, well, when the when the when the neophytes set San Inez on fire, our devout ones ran in and saved whatever <laughs> this tapestry or the vestibule or, or some other thing, you know, like the, the, the Franciscans tried to elevate natives that you know, attach themselves to Christianity in some way. But one of my, again, I can't remember which book it was, but somebody, one of the Franciscans said their, their faith is held on by pins, you know, by tax. Like it's, it, it's, it's barely there at all. Um, but I mean, I mean but that's you know, true it, for Europeans too. I mean, this is one of the things where I always exactly. like, like yeah. uh, 
have you seen Christmas festivals in medieval? I mean, obviously we haven't seen yeah. them, but just read about them. <laughs> they were fucking orgies. Like they were nuts, dude. Yeah, they made fun of the rich. They, they, yeah, they were, they were. Occasionally, they would kill a rich person. Like, it was bro, just... <laughs> when you learn from history that, um, that like the Dickens, like the Scrooge story, is to try to like make the rich people feel okay about getting like basically ransacked by poor people every year. You know, around Christmas time, the poor would come to your house and say, "Mr. Scrooge, we're gonna kill you unless you, you know, give us the." You know, he wasn't flicking the coin it, like that. That whole morality plays so that the it's for the rich to feel good about him. You know what I mean? Like, right? Yeah, it, it's it's wild. And 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 mission history, California history. You know, uh, on one hand, you don't want to overstate. Like you said, you don't want to overstate things and be like, you know, there are plantations with bells on them. It was it was slave. It was slavery. You know, it's a little more complicated than that. You know, um, but it isn't but far like, away from plantation from bells on them either. I mean, the income and the system is plantation with bells on it, them. Right? Exactly, and and when you look at some of just what Sarah was was witnessing, like you know, soldiers lassoing native women and and you know, raping them, um, and you know, his just, well, that's just the soldiers. I can't do anything about it. You know what I mean? Like that. Like when you see all that stuff play out, like I, I get. Um, you know, it's it's interesting, man. Like that at the school I do, I go to. You know, again, like they're training, <laughs> they are training the uh, the bourgeois, or they're they're they are training the, um, you know, the next generation of you know elite business and Silicon Valley, or or, or you know what I mean. Like there, there's a lot of engineering that goes on at that school. Um, but you know, the, they'll do a land back or or, or a land acknowledgement, and like down the street, my ancestors had a land grant. You know what I mean? So I I have a a like my own personal relationship to this. It, you know, like I my family has a, a graveyard that's um, we still maintain that's like a historically designated spot. You know, and it's like um, you know I'm I'm sure I'm I pass by my distant cousins all the time, uh, all around all around me because you know the the there are there were different waves of settler colonialism out here. You know, my dad's um, mom came from Scotland in the '60s or whatever, but you know, I had a my on my mom's side, I had gr grandmother who got here in the 1860s, probably. Or right? Yeah, I mean, one of the ironies of settler history is it's formerly people being settled who are often the forefront vanguard of settlers. Like it's people who are, uh, you know, like. If you want to, I mean, even in the United States, if you want to staff an army and keep people from rebelling against you, what do you do? Well, you attract all the Southerners into the military. Like that's who got land grants. That's who right. got you got a land grant if you served in the military, and, the, right. and that was it. It was a reward for being a part of the martial uh, efforts of this of this project, you know. And and I think that that's also what's fascinating to see in California history is you do have these competing interests you have the franciscan like the, from the beginning spain and mexico you know wanted to control the california missions um spain wanted them to be secularized quickly um but the franciscans were able basically to exert some of their influence because the, because it was so difficult to deal with with the the uh even establishing agriculture but also just the natives the natives just kept dying they didn't want the like you know we said softer uh, genocide they didn't want the, all these people to die they wanted them to work for them you know what i mean right uh, um so you know just, just seeing it, you know you, you you have an idea of it i mean it, it's definitely interesting because i grew up i grew up here and in fourth grade we all made the, we all did the mission project the kids making them out of sugar cubes or now you know uh, or little models out, out of the missions you know, and just in my lifetime, like the La Parisima is a very well preserved state historic park. You should check it out if you're ever around. Um, but you know, they don't they don't really they, they went from in my just from when I was a kid having like elderly white people acting in character as the indigenous, you know, making candlesticks or um whatever other thing, you know, what I mean? <laughs> or or uh, looming. There was actually quite an industry of loom weaving um at the at these missions around here. Um, but um you know, seeing just from that to now, they still don't mention the rebellion. I mean, the, the, this mission was a battleground, you know, um, it was one of the like it, it was a war zone and it's not really, really talked about. And and the other thing about La Parisima, they held La Parisima 
And it, uh, the original site of the mission had been decimated like more than 10 years earlier by a massive earthquake and flooding. Like, I can't imagine if you're on some religious uh, mission project, if your mission gets a massive earthquake, you know, basically runs a fissure through the middle of it, topples the whole thing down. Then there's mudslides and rain. Um, so a lot of the, the indigenous that held um, La Parisima had been involved in rebuilding it at a new location just like a decade before. In fact, one of the leaders um, of the rebellion, Pacomio was his name, was like a skilled carpenter because he'd been involved in that. Um, you know, so, so, and that's the other weird thing. Once you get into also Alta California, they gave uh, certain uh, in, uh, indigenous and Indian uh, people within the mission some political power. They had like, you know, basically... Uh, alcaldes or whatever you know who were basically acted uh you know on behalf of uh, as like middle management between the franciscans and the indigenous you know and then those people did it was a double-edged sword that that's the guy who ends up you know some of those alcaldes end up leading this rebellion um and and and, and that's what what i really am fascinated by this by the true match wars because it really shows that these people were you know skilled in a lot of different ways um and once they were given any little bit of military um training or or political power they used it against their captors um <laughs> uh, uh, and and they were pretty well organized and they did quite well and they they got pretty close um to you know at least overthrowing those missions but you know um that's why i'm fascinated not just by revolution but counter-revolution um and the, and and the contours of, of their the counter revolution the true mass war is is pretty is uh, pretty fascinating as well. Well, uh, uh, I would like to uh, say that I think Marxism is a history uh, is a theory as much of counter revolution as it is a revolution. And uh, mm -hmm. the, yes, I'm stealing that from Amadeo <laughs> Madriga, but nonetheless, I uh, think he's correct about that. Um, yeah. Uh, I would also think what, what I what I challenge people to take away from this wide ranging conversation is that knowledge production. God, I hate using that term, I, but <laughs> whatever. Uh, knowledge production uh, in the left does have to be much broader than a just theory. Theory is important. It gives us our norms. It gives us our way to talk about this. As you talked about today, we can't talk about this without historiography and the historiographic choices matter. Mm -hmm. um, they really do. Whether or not you counter the, the the Chumash war as a war or as a rebellion or as an insurrection kind of does matter. And uh, similarly to the King George war, our rebellion, our, the, the, the Iroquois wars, etc. Um, uh, I also think class history is more complicated in, in the United States than we tend to give it credit for, both in the you know glorious working class american sense that close that shuts out the settlerism or conversely in settlerism that pretends that all the working class was unilaterally okay with what was happening to the indigenous people because they weren't mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. um even in new spain um yeah. you know yes uh, yeah yeah that's <laughs> true and and just the intermarriage alone like uh um speaks to that and and you know it, yeah, sorry, I didn't mean to mean to. No, interrupt. yeah, I mean, well, this is the problem with talking about peoples like as if uh, they're static and shut down at the point they enter they interact with settlers because um, mm -hmm. these cultures are still, you know, I, even in indigenous studies, sometimes there's an attempt to like push post settler stuff like horses way way back in the past, and like there's not a lot of evidence for it. There's some, I'm not gonna lie, there's some, but there's not a lot. Um, and I get that. I get even why you'd want to do that. But I also feel like that freezes these cultures as like, oh, they were developing and then they met white people and they froze or died. And mm -hmm. that's just not true. Like, no. No, um, uh, you know, the, the, the Chumash still have a history, even though their past has largely been erased from them. Um, <laughs> and. And understanding, you know, if, for the modern Chumash, the Chumash war is kind of where it begins, um, uh, you know, um, and how kind of they got screwed by the Mexicans and the and the Americans later. I mean, like, mm -hmm. um, uh, you know, th there are still Chumash around, but there's not a they're not like the DNA or the Dine. There's not a ton like no. they're 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 
the reservation that they do have the nation they do have here in the county is tiny um i mean there was a massive controversy of them uh buy, they bought a piece of land mm-hmm. um across just across the highway from their reservation where they have a casino um um ironically enough they bought this land from fess parker the guy the hollywood actor who played davy crockett um for disney taught yeah and this was very controversial he basically sold it to them on his deathbed i've been told which is very controversial in the valley um i mean they, they're How like that duddle, dirty settler colonial sell sell these indigenous people a chunk of land well, like th- th- this is the, like this is the thing like i it was called camp for the land when they bought it they had to go the, our county would not wouldn't speak with them wouldn't sit down with them the like the uh, the the feds the bureau of indian affairs told them like you like said you have to sit down and, and speak with these people about the county wouldn't do it um there's just this very i mean in san Inez, in that valley you know which is like again like that's where neverland ranch and you know i mean watch out david crosby might hit you with his tesla you know if you're out for a jog like there's money out there and and um in san Inez, like when this camp four controversy was going on you'd have these people show up to the meetings at the richard spencer haircuts just railing at at you know the tribe and these people are just directly descended from the folks who took over that valley <laughs> you know what i mean from from the chumash and it was never it was never part of the plan to give them that reservation let alone let them expand it but they're they're about to open a um a cultural center and museum this year on that land that that they um they went around, they ended up going around the county to of all people doug lamalfa the uh republican uh representative who introduced the bill to congress and they they were able to get it annexed um so you know like the struggle's real uh for the chumash and i know i know i know folks who are chumash and i didn't ever you know it's just one of those I, I wrote about the the war for, uh, for when I worked at the paper, and I had a but this buddy of mine who read it later, you know, uh, talk to me about it, and he was just like, he's like, yeah, he's like, thanks for writing it because like growing up here, we knew about this, <laughs> we would sit there in fourth grade and we knew about this, but and we just sat there while everyone else didn't talk about it, you know. Um, so j- just like on a local level, this is one of those things where. People don't know that the, the Chumash led the Chumash led a rebellion against the missions. You know that was the largest uh, mi- mission rebellion in Alta California. Like thousands of them, you know, essentially either fled or fought across three missions. You know, it's metal as fuck, man. They set one on fire. You know, they uh, they stole all the best shit from from uh, Santa Barbara. You know, they held San- Santa uh, La Parisima for a month and fortified it. They were ready to fight for it, and and. When they finally did surrender out there in near Bakersfield, they did it with with I mean they had pomp and circumstance, much like a state. They waved flags, they shot off you know ceremonial guns to indicate that they were they were parlaying and meeting peacefully. Like the, the you know that they, they these were people who were already had a dynamic way of living before contact, but then at throughout all the 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 turbulent you know revolutions like that happened uh, because of spanish colonialism they were there adapting to it they were they were there um you know and they're still here uh, but but they were rolling with the punches and trying to you know every, every oppressed people tries to make the system work for them you know what i mean whether they're they're you know it's like sl- uh, enslaved people trying to sue for their freedom or or what have you but you know there's a lot of examples of it out here it's 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 super fascinating i mean i mean and and very you know still strong catholicism <laughs> within uh you know the the community within chumash uh not all of them obviously but um you know the the, the more folk i talk to and, I, and i'm always putting that out there i just want to hear from uh, uh people who uh, can tell me more about it but um it's just you know and, and again just understanding this area and the politics of this area the the uh industry the money where the money is in this area you know it's it's you know the, again like the Padres of that time wanted to be stationed in Santa Barbara because it was so beautiful but plentiful. It's still the same today. Like all the Franciscan scholars, they really want to go <laughs> get a job at Mission Santa Barbara because it's it's not just beautiful, but there's a lot of uh, power and influence, I guess you could say, um, in the area. Yeah, I think the the takeaway from this for me um, is that uh, you need a rich historical understanding to understand 
a region like just Santa fucking Barbara, much less California, much less the United States. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and it requires more incorporations of different uh, talking points. And then for me as a Marxist, putting that back into understanding economic flows, social flows, legal relations of power, et cetera. Um, when you do that, you start understanding why we are the way we are and how we got here in a way that a lot of the very pat narratives you get on the left will not explain to you much. I mean, I was talking to someone the other day about that, you know, California ideology essay from the 1980s that got repopularized recently. And I was like, hmm. maybe it's the early 1990s. It's a British guy who wrote it. Um, hmm. And on one hand, I think that that essay is accurate about Silicon Valley and was predicting where it was going to go in a pretty accurate way. And on another hand, it doesn't really understand either United States or California. And hmm. So while the outsiderness actually allows you to see things you can't see as an insider from California, sure. probably I'm probably sure people would be shocked by the predictions that that were right from that essay, you know, 30 years ago. Hmm. Um, but I'm also there's stuff that it doesn't see and get, and it actually leads you to misunderstand all of American culture. And because most Americans don't have a good sense of where they're from and live and the real history of that. Um mm -hmm. They often can be hoodwinked by things that are actually not really true and projected back on us. And then there's weird stuff like I've, I've talked about, like how European anti-Americanism is actually weirdly based on the class sensibilities of the New York Times. Like, like, and you're like, what do you mean? I'm like, they're they're mocking Americans the same way, you know, elite professionals mock poor people. Oh yeah, and, yeah, yeah, yeah. and they are doing it in an American context while claiming to be European supremacists or or actually good <laughs> European uh, cosmopolitans or whatever, mm -hmm. um, you know. Uh, and I think you can get hoodwinked by that if you don't know your own history. Simultaneously, I don't think a lot of Europeans actually understand their history particularly deeply, mm -hmm. uh, although they tend to understand it a little bit better than we do, um, mm -hmm. and. I found uh, ever since I started studying history academically, I found most people who want to talk to you about history, it's just mostly pop history. It's what they saw in a movie um, or, or, you know, like collective memory or whatever. You know what I mean? Like the things that get, it's, it's very vague, you know, and, and once you actually start talking about real history, you always have to say, well, it's a little more complicated than that. And then, you know, springboard from there. But, you know, people's like sense of who they are, um, where they come from, you know, it's, uh, it's interesting, you know, California is interesting that way because there was this movement, you know, Santa Maria used to be called central city, you know, and, and but there was this movement a hundred years ago to, well, let's, you know, let's embrace the heritage. Right. And now it's just like, it's, you don't even think about it. It's just, it's just the backdrop. You know what I mean? Spanish tile is everywhere, but it was first brought here to, so they wouldn't set it on, set the mission on fire. You know, and and um, the, 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 that's what um, man. We didn't even, didn't even get to talk about like Gramsci or Foucault and, and applying those ideas to like, you know, the 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 hegemony. Um, you know, just, just like a, how Spanish colonialism exists in California. It's just like it's just in the air. You know what I mean? And and you know, I I wouldn't be here. My my DNA strand wouldn't be here if it wouldn't. Were, you know, there's the the material, and then there's the culture too. You know, and and just how California's played out in our culture. Um, well, you a. guys are. I mean, uh, I always talk about world system theories as applied to within a nation, but you guys are both uh, a place with your own core in periphery, as we've made abundantly clear <laughs> in this yeah, conversation. That's right. Yeah. And you're also the one of the three internal cores of the United States, as yeah. I've also tried to hint at. In this it's so weird, and it's it's like it's totally fractal too, because like you know, you have L.A. versus the the inland valley, or the Bay versus you know the 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 inland, and then just in, within this county, Santa Barbara versus Santa Maria, you know, you have that you have that same thing repeated almost almost like fractally. Um, but you know, there's always some place where the 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 ruling class. Uh, 
you need to get away from all their hustle and bustle. I mean, that, that's what Santa Barbara was. Then they crested the mountains and Santa Inez became that. Now they've gotten even farther south. They've taken over this little one-on-one town called Los Alamos, just north of Santa um, Maria. It's called, uh, they call it Little L.A. But um, Los Alamos, it used to be like a, a farm worker community. In fact, Los Alamos is where they put the Chumash after after the missions. Uh, right. Missed, and and where Actually, a most of them out. The, the the valleys play a similar role to the mountains in uh, the lower yeah. Appalachia, yes. where like where like uh, the when I was a kid, we still had living memory of them bringing electricity to North Georgia in the fucking sixties. Mm-hmm. Um, whereas today, that is one of the most reactionary parts of the country because that's where I mean uh, that's where like. The, the nouveau reefs have gentrified the fuck out of the rural landscape to the point yeah. where like the mountains went from being hill people country and oh and, and lower yeah. appalachia to like compounds compounds for for uh people running out of atlanta who want to hide their money um and that shift happened in my lifetime i saw it happen um and yeah. um Whereas I saw the central part of the of Georgia, which used to be this very, it was very uh, dependent on paper mill, tobacco, and and military manufacturing, mm-hmm. get screwed over in the military reshuffling. So military Keynesianism went away. Yep. The paper mill became less important uh, and went away. And then tobacco consolidated and went away. And basically, it became like uh, Gabe Renance writes about. Um, like the industrial Midwest, this city, Macon, which is not an industrial Midwestern Macon. city, had the same patterns of Detroit because of the 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 hollowing out of the center of the state, which used to be kind of a industrial and and local shipping hub uh, for for you know cars into uh, Atlanta, Savannah, Columbus, um, which. Uh, Columbus is military. Atlanta is arts and production and basically like little LA now. And, and, and Savannah is both tourism and a major fucking port for the East coast. So um, those things together really like you want to understand a lot of the weird tensions and a lot of the racial tensions and a lot of why, like, for example, why are black people becoming more and more cons- uh, black men in particular becoming more and more conservative? You need to study places like central Georgia um, to mm-hmm. understand the dynamics of that system, the change in the role of the church, the hollowing out of the social system, uh, the way black men were systematically shut out of having a voice. And now that they kind of have one, they're kind of tired of liberal speaking for them all the fucking time. Like... <laughs> Um, it, it's it's the shift, and if you understand the political economy and the history of the area, mm-hmm. and I, I do think you have to understand both. There, a Marxist will sometimes pretend like these historical differences are just like abstractions of capital manifest. Like, no, they really do matter. Like, mm-hmm. there's a reason mm-hmm. why Georgia isn't quite the same as South Carolina, for example. Like, and that has to do with the fact that Georgia actually started out, although it gave it up really quick, as a non-slave state. Um, yep. are, are not what well, wasn't a state yet a non-slave yeah. colony and then it gave up the ghost after 20 years because it was fucking hard um <laughs> like um so it's you know and it was the colony of oglethorpe um mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. uh you know th- this is something y- you have to know about regional history and uh i think it leads to um you know, a lot of understandings about like the weirdness of modern political stuff in the South where people are going, even I was like, wait, my state's purple now. Um, yeah, yeah, you, yeah. What? Yeah. yeah. When you look at the long durée history of my state, I'm like, actually, it doesn't make sense. Like I just wasn't thinking yeah. about it. Um, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, and this history that we've been speaking to Spanish colonialism, you know, uh, Mexican history, you know, it's like, you know, or, or everybody acts, um, or, or, you know, only, I guess, idiots act surprised that Latinos don't just automatically vote for uh, Democrats, you know, by that, that it's not just a waiting game on demographics, that Latino men can, or, or women can be captured by conservative. Well, yeah, no shit, Sherlock. You know what I mean? Like, if, if you 
Catholicism for fuck's sake. You know what I mean? Catholicism, and, and, who gets to immigrate here? Um, mm -hmm. uh, tensions within the Latin community. Um, yep. Uh, yep. like the difference be between like Creole know, and Chicano and stuff like that. Like, yeah, Ch I mean, Chicano, uh, uh or like, I mean, I know people who <laughs> in their lifetime, they, they like, they, they are, they were born in Mexico. They've come here. They collected benefits. They're now a citizen and they're shitting on the people who, <laughs> God damn it. They just want to get here and collect the benefits. You know what I mean? I, I, I know people who are first generation and we don't want them here. You know what I mean? Like I, I, I had a, um, I had hired a journalist who wasn't from here and she's just some white kid from the Midwest. And she basically has whiplash because she goes to like a community meeting here in town. And it was the opposite of what she expects. There's all these Latinos going like, we don't want, we don't want them here. We don't want, uh, it's for H2A housing for federal farm worker housing. Basically Trumpism, you know, our, uh, our conservative city politics, where it was was totally fine having an ice facility built here in town, embrace Trumpism. Um, we actually had, I mean, that's all. That's a whole other subject. It's getting late, but like, um, you know, we had a there was a woman murdered in in Santa Maria um, by uh, an immigrant that tr you know Trump was bringing up her name during the election, uh, you know, and, and um, you know, so but but again, the, this this journalist was like. <laughs> Had whiplash because there's a bunch of like first generation or second generation Latinos saying all this stuff. We don't want them here. And then there's like these white, uh, you know, it's the wealth class. It's the it's the own the ranchers, the owners who are like, we got to be sensitive. Uh, you know, we got to be, because they they have a labor shortage. We had like millions of dollars worth of crop rotting in the fields because we they're literally there aren't enough people out here. Uh, um, yeah, uh, talking about this in Wyoming. Um, interestingly, yeah. the the ranchers sided with the progressives against the conservatives in Wyoming for building the uh, immigration prison by ICE here. The reason why we kind of won that um, was... You was chase away our workforce. Yeah, was ranchers going like, you're going to chase away she fucking labor. Those are oh, our shit. Latins. Like, yeah. I mean, that's, uh, how it, that, that's how it operates here. Like, literally, I mean, there was there was uh, just over the, the river, uh, uh, Santa Maria River in Slow County, they were building H2A. This is a farm. This is a farm family. It goes back. They got land they're sitting on. They're building housing on land they already own just to house their workforce because they need people so bad that the, 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 sorry that we don't have the invasion as, you know, all the conservative talk radio around here would say. We don't have an invasion of, of, um, undocumented people coming here, here to work. They're just not. Um, my next door neighbors are, is an H2A house, you know? So like they, they buy up old seedy motels in town and all of a sudden they're not targets of like human trafficking and, and, you know, whatever kinds of crime anymore, these seedy hotels, because they're just guys who are tired and just been working all day, you know? They, so there's like all, all these dynamics going on. Um, oh, oh the, there was a uh, H2A house, uh, farm work housing being built in the Pomo and someone torched it you know, yeah. like racial terrorism. Like, you know what I mean? Like the, I, I see 3% or stickers uh, along highway one in the back of dude's trucks. You know what I mean? Like uh, no, I everybody's out here. here. Everybody's yeah. out here, you know? Yeah. Well, I mean, one of the things I always like that you want to find the real fucking scary reactionaries. You don't I'm look in Cali, Texas, dude. You look in California. Like, um, it ain't one state, man. It's yeah, that's, that's no. And actually too. I have a theory about, about like why conservatives in areas where they come close to like liberals like in california like in florida uh even though they they won in florida essentially and they lost in california why yeah. they're so extreme i mean yeah. because basically um in places that are monolithically soft c conservative like utah there's actually yeah. several forms of conservatism in the legislature some of which yeah. are basically the same thing as democrats yes um whereas uh, in these places where it's contested, there is a real tendency to pull in either direction. But one more thing, and I think I want to end off this when people are wondering, like, what's going to happen in the next election and why we should start being aware of class stuff in a more serious way, um, even if you care about racial stuff. All right. I am seeing a lot of talk out of New York from a lot of lower middle class black people out of New York taking extreme anti-immigrant stances because they feel like they're their um social welfare net is under threat by these immigrants and in a in a weak sense they're right because the federal government puts the onus on paying for that stuff on the states even though the states don't control 
their um, immigration policy. Yes, the feds will help, but not a lot, not as much as it costs. So, um, so in this sense that it's actually exacerbating tensions between non-white groups who are competing for resources that shouldn't need to be competing in the ri- one of the richest cities and one of the richest countries in the fucking world. Like it, it's, it's ridiculous. And yet that's where we are. We're going to see that sentiment capitalized a lot on in the next election and people who are still fighting the old fights from the Bush and Obama years are going to be completely blindsided by it, even though there's been warnings for three years. Like, and this is why trying to bracket out class politics as if different groups, even the Chamas, don't have classes themselves is a mm-hmm. big fucking mistake. Like, mm-hmm. um, and to really understand some of these, these, uh, these subtle cl- uh, class problems as we're talking about and you, you know, in Santa Barbara, you actually do have to know local history and local conditions to be able to address it in any real way. Cause it's different in different places, sometimes radically. Um, and that's my last takeaway from what we've been talking about. Thank you, Joe. Where can people, did you even still publish stuff? I don't know. If, uh, if, 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 political pain.com political pain on YouTube. Follow me on YouTube. Um, I'm going to get back on the horse. I just, I've, you know, on a, honestly like you know um michael rang in my yeah i gotta finish my master's key michael was ringing in my ears the word a historical um and then just you know listen honestly listening to you and listening to others where i just felt like i need to hit the books a bit before you know i mean hey i guess i could have been a mine i I could be a successful minecraft streamer by now but uh (laughs) uh, or take whatever reactionary position but um you know i just uh yeah it's been a little while i'm gonna get back at it i do want to do a live stream uh, pretty soon here but um political pain on instagram twitter I, I i don't really go on x anymore it's a, it's trash um but you can find me on i guess facebook youtube my website politicalpain.com i'll be back there i might post this on there a, a link to this on there but um yeah just like hitting the books looking at um you know like with a leftist lens looking at uh, california mission history i definitely want to do some content about the true match war this year. Cause it's the um, bicentennial of it. Um, but uh, yeah, I appreciate you asking me on. I haven't been on a show in a while. This is my newest cat since I stopped streaming. And I wondered how bad this would go because she is all over the desk when I'm at the desk, but she was pretty good this time. So uh, thanks for having me, uh, uh, Derek. Uh, thanks for coming on um, Joe. People should definitely check out your work. Um, and Thank you, uh, uh I'm kind of going through my, I'm at my, uh, a little over three year anniversary and I have, uh, released like, Oh God, almost 300 shows on the Buzzsprout. Um, more than like, Oh wow. Yeah. 600 on YouTube and like prolific I guy. A, I have a thousand different things available on the Patreon guys. There's a wow. lot. Um, sign up, y'all. Sign up. Um, and you can sign up for as little as three dollars. Um, uh, I'm a, I'm a, as someone said, I'm one of the worst advertisers, which is good that I don't really care because like I'm bad <laughs> at it. Uh, but um, be, I'm, I'm going back through a lot of my OG guests and I wanted to have you on. And particularly now that you've gone back and studied history, I wanted to incorporate that topic because I do think, um, in, the, I don't know that the 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 millennial left is totally dead, but it it's it, it has ha- it, it got his ass kicked at a bare minimum. Um, yeah. Uh, by yeah. by by supposed allies, even. Um. So. Uh, yeah, that's the thing. I've been listening to all these uh you know talks and live streams and 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 reviews and all this stuff. But that that is you know um. And it, it is a little bummer, you know, feeling like I'm Ill- illustrative of some of the stuff. Like, yeah, I ain't got time to. But yeah, it was the pandemic. I don't have time to run my YouTube channel for no money and and do my journalism project for no money. And I got to go. I got to pay the bills, man. I got to keep a roof over these damn cats. And uh, I work hard so my cats can have a better life. But, you know, I, I'm studying history um, to study power, um, to, you know, to. Uh, which, which I think is, you know, I, I went, to, I went to school to sharpen the tools a bit, and um, you know, I definitely want to write more about the Chumash Rebellion. But 
you know, it's just one occurrence to explore the power dynamics that exist in our society today that existed in the past that influenced the world we live in. And uh, it's, it's undeniable. It's all around you, even whether or not you're, you've noticed it or, or not. And, and I do think the left needs to communicate, needs to be better at communicating these things, but historians need to be better about communicating these things. Um, because the ivory tower thing isn't complete bullshit. Um, you know what I mean? And, and some historians pride themselves on making, uh, arguments that are inconceivable to most of the human population or, or, you know, making points that are inconceivable. And so that's why, you know, we talked are about using journalism, language history that's and journalism. inconceivable for no fucking reason. Like... That, yes. And, and that's where as a journalist, I'm like, man, could we like make this a little more user-friendly, a little more accessible? Could we craft narratives in a way that are, that are more dynamic and engaging? And, and not to say there aren't historians doing uh, great work on that. Um, but yeah, it is getting late and, and, uh, just want to say again, I, I appreciate you having me on, and the conversation is a lot of fun, so we should do it again. All right, definitely. And on that note, have a great day.